Okay, so uh, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, just want to note in the agenda this week, we have uh, some new information in it that I'm really glad is there. It is just some points about the logistics of how the meeting runs. <clears throat> so I may say a lot of this stuff anyway, in case folks did not get a chance to read the agenda, but it's I'm glad it's there because <clears throat> it at least allows people to, if they've never been, they have a heads up as to how our meetings work. Uh, so again, if you're joining remotely, please change your name to first your first and last name. Uh, if you have any comments, please uh, start by saying your name and where you live. If you uh, are going to make a comment, if you could keep it to under two minutes, that would be great. And actually tonight, because I anticipate that tonight's agenda is going to be very full, <clears throat> I am going to ask everybody to keep their comments to two minutes and uh, we'll be timing. Donna is going to help us with timing and uh, she's going to hold up some signs that will show when people are um, at one minute and uh, and then if you're at two minutes, then uh, you'll get the, the stop sign. So uh, just be looking for that. Um, if folks are online, um, I'll just, we'll, I'll look to, we'll, we'll still, okay, so we'll still have you um, hold that up. Okay, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, uh, and again, if you uh, wish to say anything, uh, you can uh, speak to a particular agenda item when that comment, or when that topic comes up. Please keep your comments germane to the topic. Uh, if you uh, wish to speak, you need to be called on by me, uh, and so if you have multiple questions, please ask them all together so that we don't get into a back and forth. Um, and if you go on too long or you're not making germane t uh, comments or whatnot, then um, I may interrupt you and ask you to uh, to stop or modify your behavior. All right, so um, next thing is to review and approve the agenda. The only uh, item that I think that we are changing really is we're not going to do uh, the VRC Confluence Park item, the Vermont River Conservancy. So that is not going to happen tonight. Any other uh, changes to the agenda that folks know about or would like to suggest? Okay, so with that we'll consider the agenda approved. All right, so um, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for um, any anyone who um, anyone really, to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. If the topic is on the agenda, then there's usually a time um, when that item comes up for you to comment. Okay, so for now, um, if it is not on the agenda, then you can um, make a comment. We'll start with people in person. So if you would like to make a comment, come on up to the mic and uh, Donna, if you would move, I feel like we gotta move that mic. <laughs> yeah, you're good, yeah. Is this the not on the agenda time? Right. <clears throat> question um you know I was, I was here a couple weeks ago and the meetings sometimes they run really late and I was just wondering how the council might address um when there's like uh 16 to 25 items on the agenda how they will uh, make allotments for people to speak um wondering is there ever a time when the council has meetings every week or every you know, how does that work when there's so many, if a lot of people want to weigh in, but it's too loaded. So that's my question. I don't know if that can be answered. I sure. don't know if that's appropriate right now. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about that? Okay. You know, that's a, a great question. Uh, actually, the, the city manager and I have talked about that possibility, but it's, uh, it's a, a lot to meet every week. And so we try to address things that are uh, timely or urgent that week and then if something can be pushed off often we do if we don't get to it or if we run out of time um, but that's also one of the reasons why having um, uh, two minute 
limit is really key uh, to keeping the meeting moving. So, uh, but, you know, to be fair, if we ever were to actually really run out of time, I would imagine, well, I don't know that that is really, um, sometimes we'll just go very late uh, with a particular item, but, um, <clears throat> but what that would mean if we weren't able to reach a decision and more people wanted to weigh in, then we would probably um, include it on another agenda and take it up again. So thank you very much. And if you would say your name and where you live. Sorry. Mary Castier, Uma Street, Montpelier. Okay, thank you. Thank All you. right. Okay. Hi, Thomas Moore, uh, yep. Prospect Street. I was just wondering, is there something that we could do uh, maybe on a little bit more bike safety. I really, really, you know, I I had almost had an incident just starting this year out. Um, I was going down Main Street and as I'm approaching, which was it, uh, School Street? Down here, yeah, School Street. Bicycle is just whoo, straight through the intersection. I would really hate to hit somebody. I understand people like riding bicycles and want to be bicycles, but it's been very dangerous on our streets here. And when in an automobile, in an automobile, it's it's hard. We've got pedestrians everywhere. We've got people coming in and out of parking spaces, doors opening. We've got a lot. I would just like to have you know, a little bit of order on the streets. I mean, when it says stop, you stop. When you have lanes to turn, you know, like going on to State Street or going straight, you don't go over into the other lane and go through the red light and go over. I mean, you can just sit right here on the steps and see a whole bunch of it, you know, all the time. I really don't want to hit anybody. You know, I don't want to lie in bed, you know, a few years from now saying, boy, that person, I wonder what he's doing. And you know what I mean, how you think there's got to be some accountability for bicycles on the street. I want people to enjoy their bikes, but man, nobody wants to get hurt. And I don't want to be involved with it. And it's been going on for too long. You know, I mean, even one time last year, right here on Memorial, Northfield, and Maine. I'm, I'm over at the mobile gas station, and there was even a police officer in a car on Memorial to turn on to Maine, and a bicyclist coming right down Main Street, goes right through the red light, right in front of the cop, and goes right on to Berlin Street. And I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, if you're gonna use our roads, please, Obey the laws of them. I don't, you know, it's. And I'm sure Mr. Gowans doesn't want to pick up bicyclists either for recklessness. Just more safety. Can we have it? Yeah. And thank enforce you. the the rules yep. on the road. And thank you. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> um. So Donna, if if we get too much past two minutes, like, let me know. Two and a half. Okay. All right. Yeah, we get to like three. Yeah, we good. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. And anyone else in person? Um, Lucian D. Stanford. I mean, Puppy Park, yeah, has been a little bit of a nuisance lately. Well, we're trying to clean it up. Can I interrupt you here real quick? Um, we're actually going to talk about that really soon. Um, if you, are you going to be God, here? I have my two minutes. No, that's fine. Um, are you going to be here in like another like 10 Can minutes? Can I finish? Sorry? Can I finish? Sure. I'll let you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Why don't you wait till it comes up on the agenda? Give it like 10 minutes. Come to and two is we want to hear your voice. We do. Honestly, we really do. Like, do <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, I did hear Lucian ask for cl clarification when that instruction was being given, and there was no system to ask for clarification. So, um, but for those of 
folks that need to be included, uh, I appreciate you cutting them some slack until they get familiar with the system. Um, I've got pending public records requests. Uh, for some, for some un, unexplicable reason, the city manager refuses to obey the law and certify that re requested records do not exist. Uh, it's, it's an attempt to cover for the eventuality that they turn up and him be caught in another lie. So the, the law says that if you don't produce the records and it, or don't claim they're exempt, you have to certify that they don't exist by that name or any other name. Now, I've been asking for any forecast of the projected sewer rate increases for the $16 million bond. And I find it very hard to believe that no one did the due diligence to warn the voters of how much their sewer rates might go up uh, with a $16 million bond. But despite repeated requests and gentle reminders that, you know, I have to teach our city manager how to obey the law, I still get no legally qualified response. Uh, there's still inches of mud, silt, and sand all over the town. Not No improvement at all since two weeks ago when I brought it up. It On dry days, it blows in everybody's face and everybody's food. On wet days, it's mud in the middle of the crosswalk, sometimes inches deep. There's no excuse for that, and no street sweeper is going to fix it. It's, it's going to take a shovel and, and a man with a wheelbarrow or a truck to or a woman to shovel that stuff up and it's on damn near every street from one to three inches of thickness and i brought it up two weeks ago and as usual we get no response uh, the sidewalk there, there's apparently no plan to remedy the sidewalk damage that is a serious health hazard and trip hazard i bring it up recurringly and there's apparently no plan in place anywhere of how how we're going to fix those those and when uh, potholes likely are shifting the cost to the poorest people who are damaging their vehicles from the poor maintenance so while our city manager gets rich taking millions of dollars out of this town and putting us further in the hole for deferred maintenance it's going to cost us much more to fix it later um, i would just point out stephen that all of the um, accusations that you make of the city are addressed in the weekly memo, so if you would like answers, they are all there. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to, because I was not here at the last meeting, uh, to uh, say that uh, insulting members uh, of our staff by calling them names is always inappropriate and, uh, well, I, I cannot uh, accept that behavior, um, which is is not tonight necessarily, but was at a previous meeting. All right. Um, anyone else who is in person? Okay. Um, so we'll go to people who are with us uh, digitally. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Hi. So um, just to catch you up, if you would uh, say your name and. Um, uh, try to keep your comments at two minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is for uh, new ideas, new uh, on the agenda. Right. If it's not on the okay. agenda. Um, yeah. uh, I haven't looked thoroughly, uh, so I'll just try to keep it short. My name is Thomas Fallon. Um, my idea was to kind of inquire about um, new building projects. I know you guys are working on a rezoning, and that's exciting. Um, and people are talking about housing, right? And so. I support building housing, um, and we talked about it needs to be a bigger for the infrastructure to be worth the cost. You know, you need to have sort of a, a big plan in mind. And so I thought um, it might be a humanitarian or it might be a nice or necessary thing to ask whatever company is building on uh, land to also uh, donate or um, put together plans for green spaces, at least in the community, to also uh, make a commitment to that. Um, I think that's a big deal. We need a dog park too, you know? We need just basic things like that. Um, so that really sums it up, just incentivizing these companies or requiring them by some sort of uh, provision in the uh, in, in negotiations that you should and have to contribute to uh, the 
building of recreational spaces or ma maintenance thereof. So, <laughs> oh, and also, do idea. you live in Montpelier? I do, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right, right nearby. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Oh, I'm sticking around. Right, cool. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay. Anybody else in person um, for a comment that is um, on a topic not on our agenda? Okay. All right. So we'll go to folks who are with us uh, virtually. And I'm going to go in the order that you're appearing on my screen anyway. Um, so we'll start uh, with Peter Kelman. Go ahead. Um, I'm Peter Kelman. I live in Montpelier on Mountain View Street. Uh, Mary Messier's question about uh, loaded agendas and giving people a chance to, um, to be heard. Are you hearing me? Donna? Donna seems to be gesturing. Yeah, we're working on turning you up right now. Okay, how's that? That's better, thank you. Okay. Peter Kelman, uh, Mountain View Street. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, respond a little bit to Mary Messier's question about uh, giving people more of an opportunity to speak without adding too much time to the agenda. Uh, I know that the, the city is currently working with CAN, Capital Area Neighborhoods, um, to uh, uh, get a chance for the coordinators, and I'm a coordinator in our neighborhood, to meet with our uh, our uh, district uh, members of the city council to have a kind of back and forth. That would be a great uh, opportunity for people who uh, can't uh, show up uh, at, at city council meeting or can't wait until 11 o'clock p.m. <laughs> and without uh, uh, and, and really give people a chance to, to to talk more about their small smaller concerns. Like, like some of the things we've already heard this morning that we uh, this evening, which we hear during the first two minutes, so, you know, not not the major issues, the smaller issues. So I'm, I would encourage the city councilors to all take advantage of that can um, uh, initiative and to have those kind of meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vicki Ann Lane, go ahead. Okay. Um, I would like to address, um, I guess, address, I guess you addressed it too, but um, when making public comments, it seems as though um, a public comment may be completely, um, completely lost in the accusations and innuendos and everything else. Um, if, if there's a, if there's a, an important point to be made, um, it's it's gone. Um, I think if we if somebody has something they really feel is important to say, then saying it without the accompanying attack on on a person um, would be very helpful. I tend to turn off the minute I hear. Um, turn off my my brain to even listening to the person whenever I hear the first accusation out of their mouths. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Zach Hughes, go ahead. Uh, Zach Hughes, Prospect Montpelier. Uh, three different things. One, I would like to congratulate uh, Dan Richardson on his appointment to Superior Court Judge. Um, and I would just like to offer congratulations. Um, yeah. Oh, no, we, we lost you there, Zach. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, hang on one second. Um, and I will be turned off by nasty emails or communications. So I urge uh, my uh, citizenry, fellow citizenry, to uh, communicate in a uh, good way so that we can get things accomplished. Being nasty about things, I just don't understand why um, when we can communicate. Uh, we're going to be frustrated. Last night I got into a debate with somebody um, on, on Facebook with people. We were frustrated, but we weren't nasty about it. Uh, the other um, the couple of things is I appreciate the um, guidance on the agendas. 
we call that uh, our discomfort agreement uh, where I work in our meetings. We call it discomfort agreement. And uh, finally, I want to commend staff and whoever it was. The lighting in the hallways lighting up automatically, that's cool. Thank you. And Zach, I want to let you know that you cut out there for a minute uh, between congratulating um, Dan Richardson and asking uh, folks to be civil. Um, if there was anything different in there, um, we didn't. Yeah, I just that. wanted to really quickly uh, say to staff, uh, whoever it was whose idea that was, with the lighting in the hallways at City Hall lighting up automatically, that's cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, anybody else in person or virtual? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, um, not seeing anybody. So uh, we are gonna move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Uh, Jack, go ahead. That agenda. Is there a second? Okay, there's a second. Um, any further discussion about the consent agenda? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so the consent agenda passes. Uh, so we have a no mo may resolution. Um, and for that, it, I think it's, uh, Jack, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. yeah. I'll talk about that. Um, we all know that there's been a tremendous uh, problem of, uh, of pollinators across the uh, state and across the country uh, suffering uh, population loss. And so what I've I just started reading recently that a number of cities in Wisconsin have taken up the uh, the cause to encourage and foster pollinator growth by encouraging the uh, their citizens to refrain from mowing their lawns through the month of, of March of May because uh, late spring early summer the month of May is the time when pollinator populations are uh, building up and becoming more active. And uh, so the proposal is, and the resolution is in the packet, I'm not gonna read it to people, that we encourage people in Montpelier not to mow their lawns in the month of May, give the pollinators a chance to, uh, to grow, start uh, pollinating gardens and, and wildflowers. And uh, that's about it. Thank you. Is there a motion regarding this resolution? I move that we adopt uh, the resolution. Second. Okay, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right, thank you. And thank you for uh, bringing this up. Uh, this is great uh, to encourage folks to not uh, mow for the month of May. I know I'm not usually the environmental guy here, so I thought, well, I, I'd do that. We all are, right? A little bit? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Donna. Just along those lines, when the cemetery stopped mowing because of not having the staff, they've continued that. So the spring is wonderful for wildflowers in the Green Mountain Cemetery. People should check it out. Cool. Well, that's good to know. All right, uh, so uh, we are skipping the uh, Vermont River Conservancy items. So now we're gonna talk about uh, the Girton Park structure um, on the site that's 12 to 16 Maine. The way uh, we're gonna structure this time, uh, uh, Bill, if you have anything that you wanna say, I'll let you have dibs, and then we'll go to the Chiefs, because um, I know they um, have some comments that they wanna make. Then uh, if there are questions that we have for any of, of those folks, we'll have questions just from council. Then I want to hear from the public. Uh, that'll be the, the public's opportunity to, um, to give us your thoughts. And then we'll have a discussion as a council about what, what we want to do. Um, so we'll start from there. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Um, if there's anything you want to say. Well, uh, I would say, I guess, that I started this conversation this spring a couple meetings ago by um, noting that we'd had a huge amount of calls, uh, taking a, a lot of public resources, responding to uh, this location, both police, fire, and others. And my recommendation was that we remove it. And the council, I think, appropriately said, well, then let's have a public conversation, which we started last week. And I, there was also a special meeting that was held and a lot of conversation being held. 
um, and that has continued on to this week. I attended the Homelessness Task Force meeting today, and there was a good deal of conversation there about it as well. I do know that uh, both chiefs have uh, more specific information other than just sort of me saying it, and I know would like to address that. And I think it remains at least staff's position uh, where, where we are, but we certainly respect the public process and understand that it's the council that makes these decisions. Okay. Thank you. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna invite the chiefs up um, to the table. Either way, whatever you'd like to do. Good evening, Robert Gallons. I'm the fire chief. I wanted to. Um, Andrew, we're talking to the mic. I got it. That's why I should have stood over there. <laughs> so, again, Robert Gallons, fire chief. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about um, our responses to there and my feelings on, on uh, whether that park should remain in place. So since the park has been there, we've responded there. Um, we've responded to fires three times with, a, with an actual fire truck. We've gone three times to put out a fire. In addition to that, our duty officers on two separate occasions have walked over. We didn't take a fire truck over, but the duty officer would walk over and address people burning. They were having fires. That was on two separate occasions. And then it was, it was either three or four weeks ago on a Saturday I myself went there three times. Um, I, I was going by, there was a fire, I stopped, asked them to put it out, they said they would, and it took two more additional times of me going over there to, to ask them to put the fire out. In addition to that, we've had, since it's been there, we've had 13 ambulance calls. Um, they range from medical emergencies to drug overdoses to intoxication, highly intoxicated, uh, and then finally, fights and assaults. That's a lot. If, if we had that many calls at one of our bars or restaurants, if we were responded that many times, we'd be asking questions and we'd be trying to figure out what's going on. So I think that's a lot. So I, I agree with the city manager. I believe um, it's time to remove the Girton Park. Um, and what I think we should do is put it somewhere where it's safe. Um, I don't know if that would be the public works garage or some dump. Put it somewhere where it's safe and continue this public discussion until we can figure out what to do with it and the best place for it. I'm afraid somebody is going to get seriously hurt there. If we continue to do what we're doing, either leave it there or move it to another spot on that, somebody's going to get seriously hurt. So I think we should remove it, continue the public discussion, figure out the best solution for it, the best place for it, and then um, re relocate it. All right. Now? Not yet. Thank you. Okay. And they. Uh, not. <laughs> not yet, Lucian. <laughs> Can I speak now? You know what? Go ahead. Go ahead, Lucian. He's right. Not, it no. has been a nuisance. But removing it just shows our students and our kids that any hard work that they ever did is worthless. Yeah, you got a bunch of bad apples in the seed. It doesn't mean telling our new youth that anything they do in hard work is worth nothing. It was built in 2017. So you're telling that whole generation that their hard work was meaningless. The guy who helped build it with them showed up because we cleaned up after the people who make a nuisance of it. After that, it's not all of us. I mean, as a homeless person right now, I get what he's saying. I do. I mean, I find it appalling. But we still do it. We still clean up stuff one another. And we still try to show that our future generations work is not worthless. You keep wanting them to stay here. If you tear down the stuff they built, <coughs> that ain't saying stay. That's serious. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go now to Chief Pete.
Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, members of the public. Uh, Brian Pete with the Montpelier Police Department. Uh, just in, in regards and in, in, in other follow-ups, some of the, uh, just in bullet point format, um, that, again, the, from from what we've been seeing there lately, that we're not seeing that the, the that the parklet is more of a congregational place. It's not an issue of folks who are actually living at the at the at the park right now. It's more of a congregational area. That there have been several open fires uh, that have been seen and reported in and around the shelter. That the Montpelier Police Department has observed a majority of those who uh, some you know respectfully who have fallen asleep at the structure have done so because of intoxication. Uh, with most all leaving uh, during the nighttime to go to more appropriate housing areas. Um, rather than staying there, uh, rather than using that actual shelter. Uh, each time the Montpelier Police Department and the Fire Department have been called to disturbances or incidents at the shelter, social services and assistance for placement, um, for housing, uh, social organ uh, for just for social support uh, have been offered all time, at every time, and most, if not all, always has been refused. Um, so we are looking, we are approaching this with a trauma-informed approach. Uh, doing our best, but the focus is on the behavior of the sh of, of what's going on at the structure. Uh, brief informal discussions with pedestrians, business owners uh, revealed that there were unreported complaints that we don't know about or have not formally been told about, and concerns of fights that have not been reported to the Montpelier Police Department, potential drug sales and use. Uh, it is MPD's observation that the behavior and the activity uh, cause other members of the public to avoid use of the space, including those who do who still who are experiencing homelessness um, for concerns of their own safety. Uh, the Montpelier Police Department has observed members of the public enabling substance abuse disorders uh, to those who are at the parklet by providing alcoholic beverages to those who are congregating in the area. And that the Montpelier Police Department is concerned that any relocation of the structure along the bike path will result in the same issues and complaints that the council is attempting to address and resolve right now. And, and, and what I'm saying is not, I'm not targeting folks who are going through a hard time right now. It's 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 a very difficult conversation. And how do we deal with how do we help those who are there who are struggling with with substance abuse, mental health issues, or anything else that's going on? And and how do we reach that? But the other issue is just to us, it's safety, it's behavior, and it's it is what it might escalate to in other places. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions? Oh, yes, Donna, go ahead. I think right. we have Chief yeah. Pete. <laughs> but the individuals who are having the issues of behavior problems that are acting out and in any way harassing others or hurting themselves, they're still going to be in our community. Where are they going to go? And why does that make it any less of a problem? So help me understand that. I think that's a, that's a very good valid point and it's I don't respectfully I don't think that it's necessarily the council's task if you will it's it's a very impossible task to try to to to, to, to try to identify a location where folks may be able to congregate, but then also keeping in mind what type of behavior happens in those congregational spaces uh, so I, I think that there have been some folks who have been who are at that location. But because of past behavioral issues, the, the other locations they can go to, to whether they can stay there, whether they can congregate or anything else of that effect, they're no longer welcome in those locations because of past behavior. So it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a difficult situ uh, situation, but I, it, it's, again, it's just more or less along the lines of behavioralism because we can come there every day with the social worker we can say i have a social worker i have somebody from good sam i have the community justice center it takes two to reciprocate it takes us to outreach but if folks aren't willing to take the services or the help that we're offering as a as a collective community i, I have no other answers other than what their behavior is doing to the rest of the community and how do we weigh that so so if, if they were like they used to be several people over near the bridge where we're hoping to have the confluence park i mean there were incidents there i would see the ambulance or i see the police it's the same sort of thing just in a different location so when you look at the whole city has that behavior increased 
or is it because they're so collective we're so aware of it? I, I think that what, what happened with the behavior is that now it's, it's out in the open and that uh, and even when we respond to these incidents keeping in mind that every time not only is when we're offering social services but when we when we're trying to to resolve the situation by taking the bad apples who are being uh, uh, disorderly the other parties whom they've assaulted are refusing to cooperate as well so that there's nothing at that particular point in time there's nothing that, that we can do but offer services but the the reports that we have gotten when it has been along the park line i would argue that that behavior is still not acceptable when you're having sex on the park benches when you're urinating defecating in uh drug use or sales or even offering asking kids to buy alcohol or offering to you know sell or when kids are coming thinking that hey they might have drugs i can buy from them um, and then the other complaints about safety relating to uh, kids who don't want to use the bike path or other folks who don't want to use the bike path, not just uh, the upper crust of society, if you will, but just normal everyday people. And again, keeping in mind that there are some folks who are experiencing the same problems and difficulties, but they don't want to go to those same areas because they're concerned of their safety as well. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Jack. Thanks, Chief. Um, some of the things that you've described are uh, ordinance violations or actual criminal acts have there been uh arrests or citations no we we have not so so there are two there are two issues uh or there there are two things that we've been looking at regarding how our involvement will, will be is the first is that when we do respond to the scenes again if there's like a, an actual criminality the, the law recognizes that substance abuse disorders are a health issue, not something, not a criminal type of an issue. So it's not the fact that anyone may be intoxicated or may be uh, uh, using intoxicants. It's the issue of the behavior that may result and that un unfortunately offer that often does result. So um, when when a crime has occurred, when there's a fight there, for example, we're not when we ask the the victim of the incident if they would like to for us to do anything about it they all often always refuse and then whatever street justice is going to happen is going to happen so today's victim is going to be tomorrow's offender uh, so so that's what so we need that reciprocity from the person who's been victimized and, and then on the other end of it we uh in light of the the police review committee's um recommendations we're still trying to keep ourselves in a holding pattern to determine what that response from the police department should look like. So when we're seeing things like um, folks who are fires, when we're seeing the, the littering, when we're seeing those, those, those more than municipal ordinance violations, we're not doing anything about those because we're still waiting to, to see how we, uh, what direction we should go forward. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, Carrie and then Connor. Yeah, just to follow up on what you just said, that you're waiting for direction. And I, I apologize if I've missed something from an earlier meeting, or um, is there some specific guidance from the police review committee or from elsewhere that's telling you to stop and wait and not do anything that no. you're waiting for? Well, no, ma'am. So, so the, the, the specific incident that's going on there is, is pretty much uh, consuming intoxicants in the mm -hmm. public area. And, and that is the primary issue that we'd be dealing with. So to my understanding is uh, before COVID that we've had a rash of community complaints regarding um, some of the behaviors along the bike path and that the Montpelier Police Department had went in and tried to address this with folks, try to work with the folks who were, were involved in it, and it just got to the point that we were issuing municipal ordinance citations. And then as it, uh, as the citations went up through the courts, through the ordinance process, they were actually all dismissed. Um, not for that the Montpelier Police Department uh, were harassing people or we weren't doing our jobs correctly, it was just that the courts themselves decided we're not going to handle an ordinance violation so that kind of leaves us with no teeth at this particular point in time to deal with behavioral issues so one of the specific recommendations that came out of the police review committee was um was the recommendation to to repeal the ordinance regarding uh folks who are drinking in public right. and that's why we're in a holding pattern that when i'm seeing somebody who's walking down the street with two cases of 24 cans of beer drinking i'm not doing anything about that okay and um, so you talked about people setting fires, for instance, or building fires. And 
is that what are you doing in response to that for instance right now uh and well i can let the the, the chief respond to that but from from our standpoint I mean, we're putting the fires out and and it's one of those things that if, if it's a more or less of a, of a minor unwitnessed misdemeanor type of an issue if it's not an arson of of uh, of a building fire or something per se then it, it's the courts are going to look at it pretty much in the same way so so vermont law is a little quirky okay and and, and accountability in my are, are you looking for guidance from us about what to do in situations like that leaving aside the public drinking question which i know we're getting to later well, I, I think that more or less along the lines that we want to make sure that we emphasize um, the approach that the Montpelier Police Department uses as we're responding to these types of calls for service, to quality of life, life issues, as you will. And we want to make sure that we reinforce what our, what, our, what our strategy is and how we go about doing policing and to make sure that it's conducive to what the council wants us to continue doing. Again, we don't just arbitrarily go out looking for somebody and then you know, uh, issuing a citation or an arrest, there, there's an entire process that gets up to a point that we want to handle at the lowest level possible and without involvement in the criminal justice system. Thank you. Uh, Connor. Thanks so much, Chief. Um, and I, want, I want to say, like, I appreciated the way you framed it a couple of weeks ago, that like, is we may fancy ourselves geniuses around here, but we're, we're not fixing homelessness, right? Um, no matter what we do, we don't have the resources. Uh, we're kind of lay people in this area, so you know we're, we're learning like everybody else. And uh, I said today in homelessness task force, I'm pretty convinced whatever decision we make tonight is going to be a bad decision, right? Because there's going to be unintended consequences. Um, you know, people are not going to be happy no matter what we do. Uh, I think what I'm trying to, and I'm taking this approach like just want to do the least harm possible, right? That, that's the best we can do, like the least harm. And to me, it's, I think the question is, like, by the virtue of existing, is this structure inviting bad behavior and dangerous situations that would not exist otherwise? Or if we remove it, is it just going to push it into the shadows and it's still going to happen, but we'll be getting less complaints? Um, and is there any benefit, I think, uh, would be the question, in having it in a public place? where your officers could develop a familiarity with the population in a centralized location and, and sort of suss out, okay, you know, someone has been drinking, but like, he's not dangerous, right? And could that result in less bad outcomes in a situation in the future there? I don't know if I'm articulating that well, but having a centralized place, I know the service providers are saying that's, that's a real benefit. I, I can just go sit on the, you know, and I can direct them to the services. Uh, but I just want to go in like eyes wide open and, Okay, if it's if it's less complaints, if, if if it leaves, that's a discussion we're having there. But you know, we should be honest with ourselves. Yes, sir. And and, uh, and again, uh, this is no very this is no easy decision for you all to have to make. And so I'm I'm definitely not envious of you. But I know that I I know that uh, that everyone's heart is in the right place. That there's nothing malicious or vindictive in the conversations that folks are trying to have here, and that it's a very complicated situation. Um, I, I think as far as like a centralized congregational spot, whether the shelter is there, whether there will always be a spot that we will become aware of because we will get numerous calls of service. So whether the shelter goes away and that folks decide that they want to congregate in another area, then then we will know where that area will be soon based on the, the volume of calls of services that we're going to get. Um, the officers do have very good relationships with folks. Uh, we know uh, folks who are who are at the parklets, who are um, experiencing homelessness, who are congregating in those areas. Um, they know who we are. Um, so, so that relationship is there. So when we're reaching out, hey, have you talked to Susan Lemire yet? Have you talked to Good Sam? Or have you? So those conversations happen on a very, very frequent basis. My, whether, I think that no one can control the behaviors or anything that's going to happen in that sp specific area, that no matter what the council decides to do, you're not going to be able to control it. So whether the parklet stays there or moves someplace else, you're not gonna be able to control that issue. But my other concern regarding that is necessarily the safety of the individuals who are at the parklet, who are being attacked by other folks who are congregated there. So, so, so those are the safety issues that, that I'm thinking about. So I don't think it's going to be one of those things that when the parklet goes away, everybody anticipates or expects the, um, 
the behavior to stop from some individuals because it won't. It'll just relocate to another to another area, but you may not have thefts from you may not have as many thefts from from some of the merchants in the area. You may not have as many uh, quality of life complaints related to urination, defecation, or or people witnessing fights that are you know that are triggering uh, and and that are in some cases extraordinarily violent. So it's 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 one of those things it's like yeah yes it's going to happen and i don't think it's a, an issue of anyone who might try to shame folks and saying oh you just don't want to uh to see what what's going on in society you didn't create that issue um you're doing your best to try to remedy as best as possible but whether the council can truly uh, control the behaviors that are going on there is it's beyond your grasp mm -hmm. respectfully mm -hmm. no, no, fair play. Um, any other questions um, for uh, the chiefs or for Bill? Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and so at this point, we are going to move uh, to public comment. So uh, if you are here in person, we will start with you. Uh, and again, uh, uh, Donna's going to keep time for us and hold up signs to try to keep folks to. Uh, to two minutes. Um, the other thing I want to make sure that everybody's aware of is that I uh, am not going to uh, allow folks to go multiple times. So um, whatever you've got to say, you've, you've got, get yeah, get it said. <laughs> and uh, you've got sort of one, uh, one opportunity there. So um, I think that's all that I wanted to say about that. Uh, all right, go ahead. Now is a, a good opportunity to say your Here's name and, and where you live. Hi. Um, hi. My name's Chris. Um, I recently relocated down here, um, and I I've heard a great many points about um, the park that that you all are talking about. Um, when I first came down here, I um, I went to the shack, um, and I I got help there. You know. Um, I've been going through a rough time. I'm staying at the hotel. Um, so I needed help and guidance and I went there and it, it was, um, given to me. Um, you know, the counterculture that we're all talking about, I guess, I think the main points are safety, health, fire issues. Um, and respectfully, I agree completely. Um, as far as the safety with the fire thing goes, I mean, we got to look at the stats. We got to look at Burlington, you know, um, quality and had over, you know, 38 um, overdoses last winter. Um, the fire thing is legit. You know, the, the park is pretty wide open and everything. And I agree that is a safety thing. But um, I think and also the officers talking about the behavior of people um, of that culture and out on in the park is a concern also the violence and the health thing the uh, safety thing with the fire are very good points um, but what I what I think about um, the solution to everything is I think that um, like a mediator between the police between the fire the fire chief between the city council, um, the people that really generate and are at this place are very, um, they're very, they're good people. So the communication, I think, needs to be gapped, some sort of mediator between the police and people who are going there. Um, I think that it should stay. I think maybe there should be a porta potty. And I think also maybe some shower places for people who are homeless. I recently am homeless as of Monday. I have to be out by Friday because of certain rule breaking at the hotel. So I'm now homeless. Um, I just believe that there should be some sort of solution to mediation. And, you know, as far as the stigma within the community with our young people, I have seen many times young people bring up pizzas and bring up boxes of food to us. And we have people who take them from them and we have great conversations with them. We kid with them. We teach them, you know, uh, we're not all there just getting wasted and 
fighting and starting fires. Um, hey, Chris, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you. Uh, so, if you. Just wrap your thoughts up. Yeah, yeah basically, thank you. I think my thoughts are, um, I think the solution can be within a communication between the police, the chief of police, the police officers, becoming more communicative with the people that are there at the shack and um, maybe a bathroom and a place to shower for homeless people. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else in person? No, you may not. I've been speeding that, nope. I've been speeding that for touching the microphone. Okay. Stand, okay. So. Yep. Um, so the quality of life, I hear about this quality of life and I ask whose life? Um, and I hear about all these crimes. Uh, how about the crimes of reckless indifference and negligence by the council? You've had two and a half years of the homelessness task force. You still don't have available bathrooms. You still don't have available, you know, phone charging, et cetera. So, you really need to own this, uh, your own delays and procrastination. How long has the toilet committee met yet? Uh, yeah, so there's another example. It was appointed, what, six months ago? And the toilet committee hasn't met. It was following on the homelessness task force that was supposed to deal with toilets. So we hear that there's a huge amount of calls. I can tell Frazier coached his two witnesses to try to get this thing yanked out from under the homeless. but. The huge amount of calls, there's no paper trail. I've done a public records request. There's no evidence of any huge amount of calls. It's very irresponsible to claim huge amount of calls and not have a paper trail of who's calling about what. Um, no arrests and no citations, even for the vandalism, the donated chairs, you know, maybe that's still under investigation and that so whoever smashed the chairs, who I, I know who smashed the chairs, uh that that one is pro prosecutable and restitution etc but you set an example that anything goes with no no uh consequences by not but also i'm i wouldn't bother calling the cops because they still haven't owned up to acknowledge stealing billy's beers when you steal unopened beers from a homeless person and and you can't have the integrity to own up to it and replace them then you, you, you've lost the credibility of the, the, those who are cho assigned to enforce it. So your fires, fires are harmless on, a, on an unburnable hill. You know, they're, it's, it's cold outside. People need to keep, have some sense of warmth. Uh, this is a, a, a manifestation and enlargement of your own creation. And I resent that you narrowed to two minutes. You let some people pontificate on and on, not saying much, and then you narrow the people who've done the heavy lifting on this issue for a long time to two minutes. It's very hypocritical. Thank you. All right, anyone else in person? Yep, go ahead. Yep, sure. Uh, I wasn't going to speak tonight, but I, I guess I will here. Uh, I did write a post on Front Porch Forum about it. Um, I think uh, what Steve just said about fires, I don't think that's a nothing thing just because it's an open lot. It is, it's something that's important. The wind comes up, you know, it's dangerous. I would really like to see the drinking. Uh, I would like to see public drinking stop. I mean, I'd like to see people are always going to hide their drinks and stuff, but I would like to see it enforced. Enforced. Uh, we, you know, I, I just don't think it's right, and it leads to problems. And uh, the sh the place itself. A small closed in area uh, that's inviting trouble. You put that anywhere, you, you know, lots of kids or other people are going to use it, and, you know, uh, you're going to get some bad behavior. I'd really like to see that be a park if possible. 
I don't know how much uh, it costs to have it investigated for uh, the pollution that might be underneath. I think it could be a great park. And uh, I'd like to see that. So I'm on the fence about tearing it down, but I think it should be like opened up more, more windows. And I know that the feeling about people needing privacy, but it does uh, create a situation where bad behavior can happen and sometimes not be seen until it escalates. So, uh, no, I, I'm really uh, torn about it, but in the future, I would really like to see that made into a park. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from other people what they have to say, because I think people can have some great ideas. I really like to hear those productive ideas. Um, but I'm really sensitive to uh, how things are going. And even, you know, many people are triggered by things that go on there, fighting, I don't like the litter. So I guess that's how I'll sum it up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else in person? I'll have a comment about Girton Park. Yes. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, right. right, I want to look what, back. What's your um, name? My name is Susan Merchant. Okay, thank you. You live in Montpelier. No, I'm not from here. But I want to look back on minutes from the meet, special meeting on April 7th. And Peter Kelman uh, stated something, and he seconded something that Morgan said, that homelessness and the gazebo are not the same problem. Okay, homelessness has nothing to do with that structure. I said this today, and uh, I don't know, you were on the Zoom, I think. Uh, you could put that structure on the moon, and you're going to have the same. You're going to have the same people come. Okay, we're we're still going to have Diane and Mike out there, like trying to break up the fights. Okay, I came in like last summer, and it was like brought it up again at homeless. You're going to have an encampment issue here in a couple of weeks. These hotels are going to kick out. There's got to have, you got to have somewhere for people to go. I mean, yeah, there's a professional homeless in this town. You could give them a mansion on the beach with a, a, a service and everything, and they're still going to go camp out. Okay, you're going to have to have, don't you give me that weapon, sign woman. I <laughs> 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 search. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't laugh, Carter. Stop. <laughs> You're going to have to do something about, I know about the floodplain and all that crap. All right, this is not Tennessee. I get that. But honestly, somebody's got to pee somewhere. You're going to have to put porta potty somewhere. I will put concrete blocks around it myself. I don't care. Seriously. You're going to face the same issues over and over and over again. It's not going to stop. Like I said, you put that sucker on the moon and they're still going to come. And you fly spaceship up there. Okay, go ahead. But seriously, guys, like, get it together. And I'm willing to help. Like, we had issues today, like, on task force. Like, let's go look at what other cities are doing. And Burlington with the pods. Like, talk to their law enforcement. There's, you're either part of the solution or part of the problem. One or the other. That's it. Thank you. So I'm quit at me. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I know there were a couple hands back there. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Thomas Fallon again. Um, how do I follow everyone's? You know, uh, my talent is to hear accusations, hear fierce words, and hear also the goodwill behind them and thinking, I have these same thoughts and I love that. There's so many people in this room that remind me of the genius. And um, how, do, how, do I, how do I sum that up? Um, it's about morale, increasing morale. Um, we sort of, I mean, hearing about the history of these issues, especially something like a bathroom, a public restroom, I mean, if you don't want to deal with urine and things like that, please provide these resources. My question to you genu uh, genuinely is, what do you need? Do you need a drawing? Do you need a plan? 
I will work with the architect. I, I've been trying to field opinions. We just need to know what is actually necessary. Pure, purely budgetary, is that the issue? We will do a GoFundMe. We will figure it out. Uh, we just want support and to be heard. And um, Susan's been an amazing uh, arbitrator, but she's just one person. Um, she's uh, drawing attention to the issue that these service providers are digital. We're, we're all sort of hiding at home a lot of times behind our computers, and so do they. But what if you don't have a home and the shelter's closed and you don't want to go up to your tent and just hang out by yourself or drink alone? These issues, um, I think they, they bring us together as a community to expose the weaknesses. Uh, so it's way too much to talk about this all at once. You guys need to parse these issues out. It can't just be all about the park. You have to really um, incentivize the discussion on tackling homelessness. So my idea with, um, with uh, any new money coming into town, any new building projects, I'm not standing in the way. I would love for that to happen. Uh, and I mentioned before, please incentivize them. Uh, give them stipulations that they must give back to local humanitarian organizations. Um, invest in parks, creation of park spaces in Montpelier. Myself, I like to go to Pocket Park, but sometimes I feel there's a violent atmosphere, so I walk away. And there's not much else to do in town besides, you know, uh, walk. So we want more uh, green spaces, give people uh, Give people that that opportunity to um, enjoy a bike path, but uh, but have somewhere to go that they can enjoy. I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. Same oh. being the alcohol. Yes, so, uh, well, the alcohol, the public drinking. Uh, we, I mean, I myself ex have experienced an immense uh, uh, sense of gratitude towards the police force for the for their um, humanitarian approach to this issue. Um, I, I feel we we're making progress last meeting about um, people actually wanting to to renovate the space because it it's at the front of our city. Um, Thomas, I'm going to interrupt you yeah. if you um, wind up your uh, comments. Again, it's yeah. hard to wrap it up, but That's I'll end okay. somewhere. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, the be-all, end-all is if this discussion is about that specific space, please beautify it. Please um, give us a way to collaborate with you. I, again, I would say I am willing to help work with an architect to draw plans, um, do whatever work is needed. We just need to know what are the obstacles and how can we tackle them. We want bathrooms, okay? Great. It's been two years. Thank you. Oh, no, so, or, um, uh, you get, you get a shot for a public comment one time, but thank you. Okay, thank you so much, thank Thomas. Thank you. Um, anyone else in person uh, wish to make a comment? Okay. All right, so we're going to go to folks who are with us digitally. Uh, Zach Hughes, you are up. Go ahead. So I'm going to try this. It might cut off, but I will be responding in writing because I don't know if I have enough time to put everything in there. Um, I will just um, state that um, I guess in response to the uh, fire chief and police chief around responsive calls, uh, you know what? Uh, we do have to ask questions, um, and I and I'm, I uh, would like the city uh, in the community to um, take a big step in the next year and do something big. Look at Burlington and Barry. Let's do something. And I, but I want to just uh, restress that the city council here has been very supportive on the homelessness task force. But we now have to move forward and do something a little bit bigger. And I'm hoping our funds uh, help us with this. Um, and I have concerns. So again, my my big thing though, when you when you say there's a lot of ambulance calls. I guess uh, I'd rather have the ambulance calls than have someone out in the woods. Um, and this is as real as it gets. Um, so this isn't going to go away. And I'm going to be very nice about this and not nasty. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, Peter Kilman, go ahead. Uh, Peter Kilman, Montpelier. Um, I sent a, a proposal to the city council, which is, is entitled a holistic framework to address the needs of all who live, work and recreate 
in Montpelier. And uh, the, I wrote just half of it and I called it, It Takes a Village, addressing the immediate, urgent and tractable elements of this challenge. Um, I, it's obviously too long, I'm not gonna read it tonight, but I just wanna make the first couple of points that I start with, which is that the controversy surrounding the downtown location of Gwerton Park structure, as well as a longstanding and worsening situation for unhoused people in downtown cannot be addressed without recognizing that they are just two important parts of a much larger picture, which is the quality of life of all who live, work, and recreate in Montpelier. Um, I have had, uh, I've sent it not only to the city council and the city um, uh, manager's office, but also to some of our state representatives and a bunch of individuals. I've had some very positive feedback from a lot of those individuals um, and one person at the state who forwarded it on to other people at the state. I would love to uh, hear back from some of our city councilors about it. I'd love to hear back from the um, uh, city manager's office as well, um, because like Zach, I feel that something big needs to happen. Not only that, but I think that something big can happen. And it happened, it's the something big I'm talking about is about 10 different smaller things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Don Little, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Don Little, I'm a Montpelier resident. I am on the task force, although I'm not speaking officially for them and I, I do outreach work with people outside. Um, to respond to some of the things Donna said earlier, um, Girton Park did not cause the behaviors. If we move the park, the behaviors will not stop. We are just pushing them out of the way to a place which may not be as safe for the people involved. However, I will say that having it right on the street where it is now increases the friction, increases the annoyance level for others in the community um, and the discomfort, understandably. Um, the other thing it does, having it right on the street like that, I. I know that it's increased the number of erroneous calls that tie up police time. I think that if we did have it back, I think it's good to have it in a central location um, because there are some safety factors and efficiency factors involved there. But having it right on the street, again, I, I think that's not a good idea. I don't think it works for anyone involved. Um, not, the, not the people who go there, not the people who have to walk right by them we essentially moved it from a place where there was friction <clears throat> due to the location and moved it into a busier, more central spot. Um, also, I would say that having only the one spot there, uh, if the weather's bad, causes to everyone to gather in one spot. If they were, if it was dispersed a little bit, as Mary had said at a previous meeting, if there were more than one place to go and sit, people could separate themselves out and that would reduce tension. Um, it may be that not, I don't know when all of the fires occurred, but I do know that some of them occurred during extreme cold weather when there is no place for people to go to get warm. Um, so having a place where people could get warm on the weekends, for instance, would reduce some of those calls. Um, I've also, the other thing I've noticed is that very often when there is the potential for serious for a serious confrontation that other people there will step in, uh, that they have called the ambulance when it was necessary. However, a lot of people out there don't have phones. And this has been a problem. So having it in a relatively central place does allow people to get help. So I, I guess I'm saying that there is a balance between having it right on the sidewalk where everyone has to walk right by it and having it off where it's where it's not, you know, where it's out of our sight, but it's more of a safety issue for the people involved. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else uh, who is either uh, with us in person or online? Uh, Rebecca Copans, go ahead, go ahead. Hello. Um, so I'm, I've been attending a lot of these meetings, um, and I, this is the first time I've spoken and I want to tell you about three things that have happened in the last month. Um, I'm a, I live on Cliff street. I'm a parent of three children. Um, so 
I pulled into the alley going to the hardware store um, in my car. Two people were fighting in the alley, so I stopped on the other side of the sidewalk to let them clear. And then as I was waiting, someone walked over, um, hit the roof of my car and started screaming at me and swearing at me um, with my child sitting in the back seat. Um, so that was one. Um, my kids had a bake sale for Ukraine to raise money for Ukraine, Ukraine a couple weeks ago. Um, and this person was riding his bike um, from the shelter, dropped a wine bottle in the middle of the street, shattered it everywhere. And then he looped around and came and stopped and you know sat and talked to the kids for um, quite a while. And he was completely drunk. Um, and it's just, it asks, you know, it, it, it begs the question, is drunkenness appropriate in town with children? Um, a third one just happened the other day. Uh, my son and my husband went to the, the, um, the, book the bookstore. They leaned a bike up against the bookstore. They came out just a few minutes later. The bike had been thrown to the ground and um, a helmet was, the bike helmet was thrown in the street. Um, I know, you know, I hear what people are saying that homelessness did not show up with Burton Park, but these issues um, that I'm noticing in town certainly did. And I, of course, you know, I'm not going to call the police when a bike gets tipped over or when someone yells at me or when my kids are, you know, downtown and a bottle's broken, but it makes me um, frustrated living in this town. And I have um, attended all these meetings and this is the first time I've heard, um, I, you know, I keep hearing people say, let's just move the, the structure, you know, a little bit to the one side or a little bit to the other side. That is not a solution. And I think we need to think more broadly about, um, you know, we, we, toured, we bought the, the M&M beverage and tore it down. If we can do something like that, we can buy something like the Econo Lodge and build transitional housing or something that is more permanent and more um, that will have a bigger impact that will move people out of homelessness and address the downtown problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from anybody uh, in person or online? Okay. Uh, all right. So now uh, this is an. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Um, Nancy, I don't know what your last name is. Could you tell us your last name if you. Um, Nancy Bruce, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hi, thank, uh, thank you so much. So all of these um, testimonies are so powerful. And I got confused about the original. Um, item to be discussed. So if you don't mind reviewing that again for me. This is just a discussion about what to do about the uh, Girton uh, Park structure. Yeah, okay. Is, is that it? You don't have anything else you wanna say? No, I do, I do. I, I, I really appreciate what Chief Pete has to deal with and all of our officers. And I really appreciate what's going on on Front Porch Forum with people walking up and saying, do you want a place to live? No, we just want to, you know, find a place to rest at night safely. So, um, I really appreciate the complexity of the city council and what you're dealing with. And I really appreciate, um, you know, the passions of the people here. And I hope that we can find a resolution of people who need a place to sleep safely and um, in the needs of our police department. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else who has not yet spoken? Okay. 
All right, so I'm going to um, turn back to the council here. Um, thoughts on what uh, direction you'd like to go? And I, I guess I'll also preface it by saying this. I appreciate um, what folks were saying about like this is a really complicated uh, topic and issue, and it really it does feel like there's no winning in uh, in a certain sense. So we just have to make the best decision uh, we can. I know there were some comments about uh, public restrooms and. Uh, so I just want to address that really uh, briefly. So we do have a, a committee dedicated to that, but and actually maybe I can pick on you, Connor. Um, we we were going to be seeing if there was money from the state uh, to help pay for restrooms because that it's in their interest as well. Do you want to comment on that at all? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. And, uh, we've spoken about this in our legislative uh, committee a bit, and we did have uh, Leonine in uh, to talk about that a few weeks ago. But you know, I, I mean. I'll speak for myself. I really think the state does have some responsibility as the capital, as a place where thousands of visitors come from every year uh, to provide public restrooms. You know, um, you know, it, to me, it's not much different than a rest area off the highway, which the state does provide right now. And to be honest, like a lot of these problems, again, it's not it's not all the feds. It's not all the state. Um, but, but a lot of this is a result of lack of planning from the state that has resulted in this situation where a lot of people feel like they don't have the dignity, I think, of you know places to wash their clothes, take a shower, you know, uh, have lockers. It's it's a Montpelier issue, but it's really a regional issue. It's, uh, you know, folks don't necessarily have a base. Um, so I, I think it's worth uh, shooting our shot at the legislature a bit. And, you know, if there is no capacity, you know, maybe we do have to look at a solution, but, you know, we're looking at like Burlington as a comparison with things. Burlington's got an $85 million budget. Montpelier's got what, we're 15, 16? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a it's a horse of a different color. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, I, excuse me, Susan. Yeah. Uh, please don't um, interrupt, okay? Yeah, well, it, so, uh, all right. So um, other thoughts, What what is your inclination, team? <laughs> uh, Jack, go ahead. I think that uh, there are a couple of issues that we've uh, that we that we need to look at pretty clearly. Um, one of them is the structure and the location of the structure. The other is uh, issues of behavior. You know, we've been told on a number of occasions. Well, like Susan tonight, Susan Merchant uh, tonight said, well, the, the location is not essential that it be where it is, that uh, we will, that people will do what they do and, and hang out whether we have that uh, structure where it is or not. Um, and but we've also been told on a number of occasions that uh, it's good to have this uh, park in some kind of central location because that, that's where um, it's become identified as a place for social uh, service providers to, uh, to meet up with people. But again, I don't think there's anything magical about where it is now for that either, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, the people who provide social services are pretty good at finding people where they are. And they will find people where they are, even if they're not hanging out next to the drawing board and next to Shaw's. So I don't think it has to be there. Um, the other thing about social services is that we've been told that uh, when they've been offered, they've been routinely rejected by people there at the park and so it makes me question whether uh, whether that's as important a factor as uh, as we think uh, as we have been thinking that it might be i think that um, this is a terrible location for for the park, and it's also a terrible location for uh, for the behavior that we've uh, we've been hearing about. And I don't uh, and I don't minimize 
that behavior at all. I think it is uh, uh, is dangerous to uh, to people, and I think that it is, and not only to people who are choosing to spend their time there, but also to uh, other members of the community, as we've heard tonight, and uh, and concentrating this behavior in these people in one place, I don't think is a good thing. Um, having it be sort of at the gateway to the city is a terrible thing for our city. I, uh, I really don't see how we can support continuing to have the park on that lot where it is. And I don't mean just on that particular space on the lot, but anywhere on that lot. I, I don't see how we can keep it there. And I I, I think we, it should be removed. Um, and possibly not moved to any place where it's a gathering point at this point until we've got mother, some other uh, planning done about, uh, about how to address people's needs. And then the last thing I want to say right now is that uh, it's, uh, I hope we haven't given the, uh, the police department the message that uh, they're not, uh, that the city council does not want them to intervene in the case of uh, violent and criminal and dangerous behavior. Well, speaking for myself, I think we do. I think that that's, that is a primary function of the police. And I think the police should know that they will have our support if they do intervene. Um, so that's, that's what I have to say right now. Thank you. I want to jump in here uh, a little bit as well. I, I want to make sure that we are clear on our role, at least um, particularly concerning the police, uh, because while we may have uh, some authority to set some policies, we as a council really should not be telling the police how to do their job um, outside of that. Is that a fair is that a fair thing to say? That's fair, but I think yes, and I appreciate okay. you acknowledging that difference. Yeah. But I also think you know the policy and the type of policing, the level of service that yep. you want in the community is is you know, you're elected to represent okay. the community and provide that feedback. And it's our goal, you know, our job is to try to make sure we provide the department that matches the community's okay. wishes. So, I so think, hearing that is still I mean, welcome. I, right. You wouldn't okay. say, I don't want so-and-so to go out on the shift at right. this time, but to say in general, this is the type of thing we'd like to see. Then okay. We can give you feedback whether it works or not. Great. Thank you. I wanted to make sure we weren't overstepping. Nope. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, the other, uh, thing I wanted to add here is that just to clarify the choices that we have and what, what I think might be useful to hear, uh, it seems like we, we really have three choices uh, that we could make. One is we leave it where it is. Second choice is we move it somewhere where that other place is, I don't know, or um, move it uh to not any anywhere in particular like it's uh as an amenity it goes away at least for a while um so uh, it would be useful to know uh which of those uh, options uh, is most interesting to you i i also want to bring up uh you know some of the conversation that we've had around uh, services that have, be, that have been provided in this space, or at least offered anyway, uh, it, it's also reminding me not just of the conversation we've had about public restrooms, but also about uh, the possibility of some kind of a, um, a uh, what did we call it, like a service provide, a warming, uh, a warming shelter, shelter, right? So that I mean that conversation is already uh, already moving, which I'm really grateful for and you know if we had a real warming shelter then this would not be um the same conversation uh so i, I want to acknowledge that and that we are moving in that direction and uh so in light of that uh i mean that that at least colors how i how i'm thinking about this and um i just want to also um offer that uh i i 
share your uh, opinion, Jack. And I, I also don't see how it can stay where it is at, at the uh, current time, uh, just in terms of uh, the, the safety concerns that have been uh, raised there, um, both by uh, both by both police chiefs as well as um, Don Little, I, I appreciate that uh, her comments about the the increased amount of friction that is caused by it being where it is now. We you know moving it to where it is now was an experiment, and we have some data now, and um, so we we know whether or not this is is worked as an experiment. Um, yes, Don, go ahead. Uh, following up on you and Jack, I, I think that's really helpful when people have said to separate the two issues, because we've always been, I felt like a lot of guilt thinking I want to remove this structure because it's not working the way we had envisioned it. But separating it makes me say, yes, let's move the shelter where it is now, but commit to actually having some clear action of instituting some gathering places more than one that allow people a place to be so i think we have i like to do both somehow okay. yeah fair enough other thoughts uh jennifer go ahead um this is a really hard um topic and it's very close um to my heart because i have been working with homeless populations on both the West and East Coast for 20 years. Um, and I've seen a lot of things work and a lot of things not work. And as a former social worker, I feel like we're not helping if we're allowing people in two different groups cohabitate in, in the same space. And by that, I mean people that have bad behaviors and, and folks that just need a place to be. And so I really feel like in this situation, because we are, for all intents and purposes, a pretty small rural place. I'm from Los Angeles, so <laughs> Montpelier is very tiny to me. Um, moving it to a place where there are services, so moving it to another way, I feel like or close to another way would be helpful because the people that want to get services can get those services. And then the folks that don't want services still have a place to hang out. I don't think that it's in everybody's um, best interest as an outreach worker to just be going to one place because there's people everywhere. There's homeless people all over Montpelier, not just in that spot. And I think there's been so much focus on that spot. I worry that the people that are in the woods already setting up camps aren't going to be getting the services that they need. Um, and and there, it, it's a crappy situation all the way around. And the city of Montpelier and city council is not going to fix homelessness. Um, it's a nationwide issue, and it has been around as long as I can remember. <laughs> There's always been um, homelessness issues because of a, a myriad of reasons. And we're not going to solve it in one night, in one month, in one year on one little lot in little tiny Montpelier. Um, we need to move it in small, we need to do this in small pieces. And I think figuring out what to do with Girton Park is the first step. The next step is finding a place for people to go that is a safe space for everybody, like a day shelter, like a drop-in center where there's showers and laundry and places to eat and social workers if you want them. And if you don't want them, you can still hang out there. That is possible. And I would love to see something like that here. In Montpelier, we are the state capital. We should be setting some sort of tone, like this is what we want for all of our community members. Girton Park is—I feel like it's an insult um, for folks to to go be in mud and I don't know. I just I I would feel much better about people's future and people's um, safety if it was in a place where amenities and services are a little bit closer. Not that I don't love and adore you, Zach and Don, and all the hard work you do, but you're only two people and, you know, it's a lot of work and it's hard work. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. And then Connor. Yeah. Yeah, I first want to thank all the people who spoke tonight and other nights, but particularly tonight, we really heard from people who had direct experience of what's going on there and the impact it has on their lives. And so I really wanna thank everybody who who shared that. We can't um, 
we can't make good decisions without that kind of information. And I, um, I also want to echo what several folks have said about the conflation of the problem of what's happening in the structure and the problem of people who are experiencing homelessness and that we, we can't solve all of this at once. And I am reassured to know that there are conversations happening, that there is movement happening on lots of different fronts, whether it's lockers, whether it's um, day shelter, whether it's um, trying to make more affordable housing long term in Montpelier. And right now we have before us this question of what do we do about this particular structure today, right there on the street. and. So of the three choices that the mayor outlined, I think leaving it the way it is, is does not feel like an option to me. Um, and moving it someplace else uh, seems like it could be a possibility, but I, I feel like all the conversations we've had about this so far have been about trying to find a place where it can move to that will, that will be really beneficial to the people who want to be there. And we may or may not be able to find a place like that and if we can't then i think we should remove it and continue to work on that question of the place that's beneficial for the people who, who want to be there but not leave things the way they are while we figure that out yeah thank you and connor go ahead i've spoken a lot about this over the last few weeks so i'll try to be short and uh did just say right off the bat, I think everybody's coming at this with really good intentions. And, you know, I was able to run into a bunch of officers the other day and just the humanity they approached this with um, really says something. And I, I've, I've seen some interactions there where we have MPD go up and they're always de-escalating the situation. They're such professionals. Um, I think I'm going to probably stray from the majority on this one. I, I'm, I'm just not there. Uh, Again, if I, I voted to like move this, uh, and I, you know, okay, I think having it right on the street, I, I tend to follow Don Little on a lot of this stuff, uh, may provoke some interactions that that just aren't favorable, um, and maybe moving it back with the proposed location that's in the packet there by the river. I, I think that's a better solution. Again, it's not a good solution. None of these are good solutions. It's going to be a rough summer, right? It's it's going to be a rough summer. We've got some like medium term plans in the works here with the RFP going out and everything, but that's not going to come to fruition anytime soon. So what you're left with is a game of like whack-a-mole, right? And uh, I, I sort of think like knowing the location where the congregation is, is preferable to saying, let's see what that next congregation spot is. Because I think it's going to be where I think it's going to be is Confluence Park, where the tables are now. You're already seeing those shifted around right on the bike path, which provokes even more of an interaction with joggers, everything we heard about the previous location. Um, or, you know, it's going to be what we heard three years ago when we formed the Homelessness Task Force with the vendors complaining about urination, defecation, and folks sleeping and hanging out in entryways of the stores. So I, I, I'm not no Sardamas, but I think that's what's going to happen if we, if we just get rid of it. I, I think it's going to go bike path and, and downtown there. Uh, again, eyes wide open. Um, the bad behaviors are a, a result of, I think, nine times out of 10, uh, drinking, drug use. And these aren't teenagers who are popping a can or two. These are folks with an alcohol dependency who need this to survive, to get through the next day, right? For better or for worse, we don't have the treatment for them. We, we can't at the city. Uh, but somebody said at the task force today, and I think it's true, they're going to go uh, where they can walk to buy alcohol, which right now, Garden Park, there's about five places you can do that. Where's the next place? I don't know, but I don't feel comfortable voting it away completely without an idea of that, because I, I, I just don't think that's um, responsible. But again, I don't have any great solutions. I would favor moving it by the river for now. Other thoughts, Lauren, do you want to weigh in? Go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, I like everyone. It's a complex issue and really grateful for the public input and the thoughtful, you know, wrestling everyone's doing about this. Um, I mean, I, I definitely think moving from the current location makes sense. I, I see Connor's point. Is there a benefit to knowing a congregation spot as opposed to um, just 
taking it away and then it's gonna you know there's less control over it or less opportunity you're creating for a spot that might invite less conflict than some of the alternatives that might just naturally occur um I mean, I do still wonder if another way is an option. I don't know if we got any input. It's not. So. It's not an option. Okay. Did you talk to? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Conversation with Ken. He had emergency and said he wasn't going to be here tonight. I'm sorry I didn't pass that on. Uh, but that they're open to having something in this space. They can't afford anything, so it would be half. The city would need to take a lead in finding partners to make something happen there. But they're open to it. It again is near the bike shared use path. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think you, if you put something there, you need to have another place. That's the other thing I think we're hearing. We need to have multi places. When we put something there, I would want to see something really defined to meet the need and not a shelter we built for something else that's been adapted because you need more seating, you need more coverage from rain. I mean, there's just a whole lot of things the current structure doesn't do, I think, for this population. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the frustration that all of us are feeling is there's there's been a lot of good and really thoughtful conversations over the years, but it still feels like we don't have a plan with timelines and clear goals of, and I, I think we need to set more strict deadlines for ourselves. Like, we need a public restroom, and like, let's just it has to get done by let's pick a time a timeline to make it happen i think thinking about interim steps you know working towards the warming shelter and you know a bigger amenity but then is there a interim shelter that we could build this summer that we could make it a community event to come you know build something that is more for this purpose as opposed to girton park that's being repurposed and doesn't quite meet the needs so to me i'd like to see a longer term you know goal more clearly on paper than we have right now and i know that there's you know tons of work the homelessness task force and i you know i'm not at all belittling that i think part of it has been like we need to give more clarity on deadlines a commitment we put a commitment of funding in the budget which the community passed so i think we actually do have funding finally to implement some of this in a way that we haven't in previous years and so like let's map it out what can we do this summer and what can we do um you know over the next year to just make this stuff happen instead of continuing to talk about it, which I understand the frustration of everyone. Why don't we have bathrooms yet? Why don't we have showers yet? <laughs> um, so I, that's where I'm at. Great, thank you. Well, it is good to know that another way is open to it. Um, I, I'm not necessarily psyched about moving it closer to the river in uh, that space behind the parking lot um, at this point. Um, I I would uh, make the suggestion that we, in general, it sounds like, I mean, we should probably have a vote, but it, it sounds like, there, yeah. Um, do you want to make a, a motion? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> we, uh, for the time being, we uh, remove it from where it is and put it into storage. Okay, is there a second? Okay, there's a motion and a second. Discussion about that. Um, I, I would just say if we do that, um, I, I really do like um, Lauren's idea of saying, all right, well, so, but what are we doing? And let's come up with some um, deadlines and plans. And I, I kind of wonder, uh, Connor, you're on the homelessness task force. Yes. Yeah, so do, um, would it be reasonable to ask the homelessness task force to come up with like, yeah, we think we can have a plan for a warming shelter by some time or a plan for restaurant. I mean, we're, we're kind of waiting for to see if there's going to be state funding, but we should know that soon. And then once we know that, then we can probably move forward with or without, <laughs> you know, with that knowledge, right? What do you think about any of that? I mean, I, I think it's reasonable to ask. It's, um, you know, again, like any of our committees, a group of volunteers or people who are very busy with their day jobs providing these services, it's extremely limited capacity every two weeks to yeah, tackle an issue yeah. like this. Yeah. Uh, so to the extent that maybe it's more a more robust conversation with like first responders at the table with us, you know, uh, I, I think it, it needs to be a, a fuller conversation than just a homelessness task force. Okay. 
do you have any thoughts on this bill? <laughs> if not, that's okay. But I I agree. And I I you know attended the first meeting today that I've been to, and I, I think it would be a lot to ask the committee, um, other than maybe to have them identify some key locations and then you know report them to the council and get your sign on to move forward but um and we can also take it to our staff and see what we think uh you know much like we did with the locker proposal yeah. and just said hey we need to come up with lockers let's figure out a place so um you know this is clearly a serious issue and all these things need to be moved so if yep. we can do it okay i mean i also appreciate what i think it was donna i think it was or maybe it was Carrie, I forget, I'm sorry. Um, someone over there um, was saying that we, it would be good to have a plan that identifies uh, what's really needed and then we can build to that plan rather than saying, here's a structure, let's make it fit uh, somehow. So yeah, anyway, any further discussion <laughs> on this uh, motion? Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. okay. What's that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> that's okay. That's that's all right. Okay. Yes, Donna. Well, I mean, yes. She was Bill, are, do you have some ideas of how we could dedicate staff to help this move along so that? In two weeks, we can have a conversation that shows some progress. We'll talk about it with staff in the morning. Um, it may also involve a conversation of what doesn't move along. You know, there may be some trade-offs of things that are on our... Oh, oh, yeah, right. Well, and I'm still disappointed. I know because the Barry Wrecked building isn't accessible, we can't advertise it. But I want to advertise it, that there are showers that people can call and get access to. And, and with that, our bathrooms. So I just want us to try to adapt and stay within the law that we do have resources we're trying to make available, but it is it does take initiative from people needing it because it's not accessible and we can't advertise. So I just want people to keep reminding them. Yeah. That showers are available. Yeah. Yes. There's a bathroom in the police station. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, um, everybody. And um, thank you, everyone who, who uh, offered comment on this. This is, uh, is really helpful. And it's, you know, it's a, a difficult topic. Um, all right, it's 813 right now, we could take uh, a break, or we could uh, keep going until 830 uh, and take our break, then what's your preference council? Would you rather break now? Or would you rather break later? Interrupt. If the next item is lockers, yeah. um, and perhaps we could do that fairly quickly, given the... Uh, I no, I'm missing something. I okay. Suspect, <laughs> all right, never mind. I suspect it will not be quick. Okay. <laughs> so, it's okay. Uh, but, uh, so I'm getting the sense that we should go now. Okay, so we're going to take a 10-minute break. It is 8.14. We'll be back at 8.24, and uh, we'll pick up lockers then. All right, thanks. Okay, it is 825 team. So we are gonna bring it back together. Okay, so the next uh, item on the agenda is a uh, discussion of placement of uh, lockers. And so for this, I think I'm turning it over to our assistant city manager. Go ahead. For a second, while I pull up and share my presentation. I'm going to move. All right. Council, hi. Thank you for letting me present to you today. I'm Cameron Niedermeyer. I'm the Assistant City Manager. And I already noticed that I have forgotten to update the date on this. Um, presentation, so I apologize for that. But what I'd like to do is sort of walk us through the history of the locker proposal and why it's coming back to council today. So um, since 2019, this has been a topic of conversation in our community. 
um, the homelessness task force and other members of our community, those who are, have been experiencing homelessness, have been advocating for publicly accessible lockers in our community. In general, the idea would be that lockers would allow those who have been living without shelter or a place to store their belongings, a secure place to store their valuables so they wouldn't have to risk them being stolen when they are uh, out in public. So this has been proposed to council before, um, which I think was some of the joke earlier, uh, Council Member Brown. So um, that did come and I think it was 2020 when it came to the council beforehand, we were asked to take a more holistic look at the issue. So what we've done since then is um, city staff, based on the priorities that y'all have set out in your strategic plan, wanted to focus on some short-term projects that could assist those experiencing homelessness and we wanted to readdress the locker issue to see if we could help solve some of the issues that were brought up in the first round when this came to council. So we discussed many location options. We worked through policies all together that could assist in keeping the locker safe and secure for all. So we took a couple of different locations um, under consideration. The one that had the most support internally uh, was behind the rec center for a few reasons. It's out of the floodplain. It's visible from multiple angles. However, it is private enough for dignity, dignity concerns from those who are experiencing homelessness. It is well lit. Um, there is uh, quite a few street lights around that area, and I'll get to it for a second, but the DRC did review this, and they asked for additional motion sensor lighting to be installed if this does go here, which we would do. It is close to downtown and is accessible and no other construction would be needed to support this location. We discussed some other options, and so I wanted to sort of run through our thought process about each of them, because I've heard uh, these um, locations brought up as possible alternative locations for the lockers. We discussed putting them behind City Hall. Um, however, most of the flood City Hall is in the floodplain, which makes placing the lockers difficult. The back of the building, is um, inaccessible for the lockers because due to fire codes, they can't go underneath the steps that we have in the back of our building here. Um, and the other side of the building has an ADA ramp and we can't um, block access to that. So the sides of the buildings were also taken under consideration. There are some ADA concerns there. It's in the floodplain and the other side of the building that we could put this on that has um, ADA accessibility has the teen center there. We also talked about putting it in the Blanchard lot. Uh, there was a few things that made this unappealing to staff, including that it would remove parking spaces. It is out of the floodplain. However, it is where we store snow for the downtown. To locate lockers in this location would also require built infrastructure to support them, uh, and that is not something we have budgeted for. So I'm going to move away from talking about locations now and talk about um, the policy. Uh, I am going to just uh, immediately contradict myself and say I did bring the location to the DRC and received approval from them for the location behind the rec center so that if you are interested in moving that forward, it could be done pretty much immediately after this meeting because the, uh, the permits have been approved. So when it comes to policy, this is also something that council asked a more thorough review be done on. So we've really revamped how the policy would go. In general, all of the lockers would be locked at all times with numbered city provided locks. Residents or community members who would like to use a locker would need to sign up through the city manager's office and then would receive a key to unlock one of those already locked lockers. So there's a use policy that I included in the packet that would include um, sort of the use policy. Basically, it would outline that lockers are a limited use uh, asset. They would be used up for three months before requiring renewal. Uh, We've covered sort of how we would handle abandoned items. We would not throw them away unless they were perishable. If a locker was considered abandoned, we would hold on to those um, items to try to connect them to their owner for a certain amount of time before we would either donate or dispose of those. 
We would ask folks to not store perishables, food, food waste, alcohol, drugs, or any illegal items in those lockers and understand and have those who are using lockers understand that they could be subject to being searched if there was cause. We asked the Homelessness Task Force to give feedback on this policy and plan, and they noted that the policy as outlined was straightforward and reasonable and um, did mention that there could be issues of people losing keys and we wanted to make sure that we had have extras and extra copies on our end, which would not be a problem. So that's really the long and the short of it. So I'll exit sort of the screen um, so that we can have a conversation. Okay, we will start this with, uh, if, there's, if the council has questions for uh, Cameron, this is the time for questions. Uh, then we'll go to the public, see if uh, the public has comments on this, and then we'll go back to the council again for more discussion. Any questions? Yes, go ahead, Jennifer. How big are the lockers, or could they be, and are they? The ones that we have looked at are, um, Dimensions for each are 36 inches wide and 18 inches deep and 72 inches high. And there's there would be uh, 12 of them total. Okay, because so generally people have. We tried to source larger ones, like the large half lockers, right. so that like sleeping bags and things could fit in them because that would be the purpose of them. Okay, cool, and like tents. And... Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Jack and then Lauren. Thanks, Cameron. Um, are are you thinking the lockers would be sited pretty much they were they are in the picture? So they were there would be a, a concrete uh, slab put down and and so, then they would be placed there. Or how how physically is it going to happen? So the DRC gave a lot of very sp specific recommendations around that. Um, they asked that there would be no feet on them so that we would account for ice heaves by connecting them to the wall, basically by putting a piece of two by four or something in between them and the wall and then connecting them into the wall, but not the brick, the, the mortar in between. So we're not damaging any brick, but we are connecting them to the wall very sturdily so that we, they wouldn't be affected by ice heaves or snow. Okay, great. Another question I have is that I've been uh, contacted by some constituents who are concerned about the uh, the location because there are lots of kids who use the uh, rec center and they're concerned about, uh, uh, as Dawn said, the friction, the uh, possible adverse interactions between uh, children using the recreation center and people congregating at the lockers. And I wonder if you had any consideration or discussion of that. Thank you for asking that. I do have some thoughts and I've talked it through with the recreation director. Um, our thoughts are that it is the back of the building and people only come in and out of the front door. Um, so there is a good amount of distance there. Um, most folks do drive their children to use the rec center. I'm not saying that people don't walk. I'm not accounting. I'm not trying to say that they don't, but this is not only if you look at the rec center, the main path to that connects the bike path to um, uh, Berry Street goes along the other side of the building. There's a divide there. Um, so I think we also have to try to think in mind that it's a pilot and that if it doesn't work, we could take it down, right? That's my um, thought process on it, especially since if they're all locked, there wouldn't be any reason to hang out there if you don't have access to it was our thoughts. Right now it is a pilot. There'd be 12 people who have access to the lockers um, in any real way with a lock to unlock and we know their names and who they are. So to me, I think it's providing an amenity that we've been told it was is needed in a way that hopefully is as safe as possible. Thanks. Sorry, I have a follow-up question to that. So I guess I didn't realize that the side of the rec building that you're proposing is not the same side as the uh the bike path side correct so it's I, still the back but it's so when you're looking at the building from the back and yeah. you see the mural yep we're suggesting the left side of the building 
and the bike right. path goes on the right side of the right. building okay. where there's a fire escape in the back of the building. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Lauren and then Carrie. Yeah, just kind of on a similar vein, just thinking of some of the same constituent input I'd gotten. So are these movable? Like how difficult would it be to move them if we try it and some of this friction does come up? And I guess just building on that, it sounds like the city's intention is to not make this like a welcoming gathering space that this becomes a new place, a hangout. It's more just a come put your stuff and that it's not going to be set up that way, which sounded like some of the concerns were that this would just kind of become a de facto place for people to gather. I cannot predict everything, but we would not be setting it up with any other amenities other than the lockers. The lockers themselves are, uh, they come in a unit. Um, I was very prepared to pitch paying for them to be shipped uh, set up so we didn't have to do that. Um, so I think it would be very easy if it didn't work in this location to remove them and try again somewhere else. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I appreciate the idea of it being a pilot and trying it out and seeing how it goes. And I'm reassured to hear that it should be straightforward to move them if necessary. So I have a couple of questions. Um, if you have more than 12 people who show up on day one and want them, do you have some kind of thoughts about how to allocate them? I do not. I think it would be first come, first serve. And also, um, I would ask that folks would not have a place that they are routinely live so that they are ple people who really need a place to store their belongings. Great. And then my second question is about um, when someone's uh, period, when their three months are up, um, and they don't show up for mm -hmm. renewal and you don't know how to contact them and they're gone, but they still have a key. Are, is there a way to rekey the locks so that it's not a security concern for the next person who has the locker? Yes, the lockers are the kind that just have a padlock. So yeah. we would just change the padlock. All right. Okay. Um, other questions? No other questions. Okay, we'll uh, go to uh, comments from the public. So if uh, well, again, we'll start with folks in person. Um, so if you have any uh, thoughts you'd like to share, now is the time. I'll go. Okay. Wow. All right, like, I've been looking over the job with like, camera and was gratefully printed off for me a couple of weeks ago. And Susan, can you, you pull that, that? Can you pull that um, microphone down to you? Back the microphone. Thank you. Is that better? Yep. Can you hear me? I told you that. Uh, the Think Dignity program in San Diego, California, and I researched that a little bit, and it really is like a conducive plan to, to give people that are might necessarily just be coming through town, you know, and get stranded here for weeks somewhere for them to put their belongings i do not think that like where you're proposing for it to go is going to be any way shape or form going to be a congregational spot i really don't because most of the people that you would be worried about are already camped out and don't care they're not going to be the ones that are locking up their stuff just saying so i think it's a great thing to do my own self personally just being in town and coming to work we're getting another, we have lockers in another way and we have them open all the time. And there's people that don't use them mm. and they're readily available. So uh, I think it's a good thing, but uh, if anybody has, look into that thing in the program where this is coming out of, which Cameron had printed up for me, look at it because it's a good program. And just anyway, just do something. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Donna. And you and others can tell me, is it big enough for people who really want to keep things? Is it just going to serve for a few people? You can't store an apartment in there, but you can store like deodorant and toothbrushes and a sleeping bag. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. it's it's big enough. Is that yes? I mean, they're six feet tall, three feet wide, and a foot and a half deep. So that's pretty, pretty big. big. Yeah, that's big. It's a lot of space. Not a high school locker. Like your gym locker and if you were in sports, yeah. <laughs> um, I do have a, another follow-up question about that. So another way also has lockers? 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. I do. They're not publicly friendly available. You have to go through another way and go speak with Ken and get it mm -hmm. approved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, other comments? Uh, Steve Whitaker. Again, three years, too little, too late. Uh, there's still a need for lockers, but putting them, you know, making people feel like you're hidden behind a building. You know, I think there's a residence on the on that side of the uh, rec center, but who's going to shovel the snow in the winter uh, to keep them accessible? Uh, the idea of privacy that that you're asking people to feel that they can leave their most valuable treasures, the few that they still have there, and somebody's got a key, the city can search it whenever they want, is is really not dignity. Uh, it's not privacy. Um, lost keys, I guess you know, lost keys with the, are, are lost locks because you you can't risk having keys found and somebody's stuff disappearing why Li the liability i just see it i think it's a half-baked proposal um bad location i'm sure people are going to bring drag the chairs from the pocket park over there and make that their their next hangout that you just yank the pocket park out from under them so you know you can smirk and pretend like you've done something Anyone else in person? Go ahead. Um, well, Mary from Montpelier, I uh, I do feel this is a, a good step. I uh, I think uh, six feet by thirty six inches by eighteen deep is huge. <laughs> it's very big. Six feet tall, three feet wide. That's that's big. You could camp in there. You really could camp in there, <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, I I think it's a a good uh, first step. I would question about. Did you say the city will have a key too? Yes. No. I'm I'm not sure about that either. How people will feel, but this is something I'd love to see more lockers, and I like the kind that are about oh two and a half by two and a half square. Um, and I'd like to see them in the transit center, like 10 of them, at least, maybe 15. You know, we want people to travel, visit, shop. So I would go for that. But at least it's something. Um, I do feel some people are going to be a little worried about um, that the city has a key. I think people might be concerned about it. But I think it's a, a step. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Carry on. Um, anyone else? Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, I got to get back to my Zoom here. Oh, no. Didn't. I somehow got kicked out of the Zoom. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to rejoin that. But in the meanwhile, does anyone see? Oh, wait. There's Don Little and Vicki Ann Lane. OK, uh, Don Little, go ahead. Thank you. Um, as far as I, the size sounds adequate, although I'm concerned about the depth um, in that some people have either uh, backpacks or knapsacks that are stuffed full. And I just, you know, is that sufficient depth to accommodate something like that? Um, I was a little concerned about the security at night, but I think a, a major purpose for this is for people to put their belongings down so that they can go to the bathroom or go to a store, get their lunch, whatever. So I, that may not be a concern. Uh, as far as liability for contents, I would think that having people sign a waiver would be adequate protection. Um, as far as the city having a key you know, in in theory, I understand that that may be a privacy issue. Personally, I suspect that city officials have enough other things to do that they're not going to be gratuitously, you know, rummaging through people's stuff. So I wouldn't really worry about that on a practical level. Um, I will say that as far as I know, another way has not had any 
issues with having lockers there. I also don't think that people are going to migrate to the back of the rec center um, to hang out next to their lockers. I think that when you take away Girton Park, that you may have an increase of people going back to the benches on Stonecutter's Way. So yes, lockers are no, there may be more people in the area near the rec center, um, whether that's, and again, as Cameron said, you know, the back of the rec center, probably not as heavily trafficked by children using the facilities. Um, that's that's really it. I mean, there are, co- there are a couple reasons for lockers. One is to store your your possessions on a semi-permanent basis. And the other one is just to be able to put them down so that you can go use the bathroom in the store without taking your backpack with you or having to carry things that are heavy when you're also trying to carry a soup kitchen lunch. Um, but this seems like it would certainly be adequate for that purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Vicki Ann Lane, go ahead. Um, is They sound relatively uh, large. Um, is there a fac- an ability for people that may not have much stuff to share? And if they have a relationship with each other to actually share the locker and have more than one key? And yeah, okay, that's my question. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, Cameron, do you have any thoughts on that? I've thought about this, and I think it's important for us as the city to have one person be a contact person for the lockers. I don't think that precludes somebody from sharing on their own terms, but I think just for at least the pilot, it's important to have a person tied to the locker so that we know what it what it, the actual outcome is. If that is a need that is identified through this pilot program, I think it would be important to to bring back any policy changes that we would have. Now, I seem to remember that there, like these, the rules around getting a locker had there uh, there were it was really spelled out, and it was like a contract or something yes um and so that's not in I, I remember seeing that i don't think that's in our packet um this should have been and it, if it wasn't attached it was the last time we gave the yeah. presentation last week um, so i apologize if that was overlooked no that's okay um i mean i i remember looking through that and thinking like this back in 2020 when it came up and i was like what's what's the policy about if you leave you know rotting food as like these are things that happen at the high school you know and we have to be able to go into them and say okay well we're gonna take out that that rotting milk or whatever it is um so i'm really grateful that you came up with a policy but the idea is that whoever is taking one of these lockers would have to sign yes a waiver contract okay that says they will follow the guidelines that are put forth to for use yeah Mm -hmm. okay um I did not see uh, any other hands. Anyone else who has not spoken yet? Yeah, here. Um, Ron, I see there. What's your last name, Ron? Merkin. Oh, Ron Merkin from Montpelier. How are you? Good, how are you? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, there's been some concern that was raised about children going to the rec center and what effect it would have with uh, people who you've already indicated have problems with alcoholism and have been fighting, et cetera. But left out of that, what no one seems to have remembered is that the uh, senior center is right across the street and it's right across the street from the, the, the road that they would take to get behind the rec center for the, for the uh, lockers. Uh, another point that I uh, noticed is that I am a cyclist and countless times I have used that path to bicycle across so that I could get to the the pedestrian and cycling path on the other side of the road to go cycling for pleasure or to go, for instance, to the the Hunger Mountain Co-op. So that I think from what I see, I'm living right across the street now and every every time or very often when I look across uh, the street at the uh, across the window as spring comes, I see lots of cyclists. Uh, going that way so that children, as far as I can see, would not be the only problem that might cause at least some discomfort. I also imagine from uh, something that somebody said, I agree that I I can certainly imagine 
that eventually people would not be only using that as uh, for lockers, but they would be using it for the same reason they're using the uh, the uh, the park, the park that, that's now on Main Street. And uh, from what I've been hearing, there have been lots of problems about that. Remember that seniors come in and out of the, the senior center all day long in front of it. And there's a park that there that um, frankly, they might feel uncomfortable with if, if homeless people start using that. So I'm very concerned about that right now. Remember the senior center, not only children. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, anyone else who has not spoken yet? Okay. All right, uh, so I'm gonna turn back to the council at this point. Uh, what is your, what are your thoughts? Uh, got, Donna, go ahead. I, I'd make a motion that we support the recommendations of purchasing these lockers and lo locating them in, in the designated space by the recreation building. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Um, maybe this will be faster than I thought it was going to be. Um, Jack, go ahead. I think this is a good idea. I think that uh, this is overdue. We've been talking about this for a few years, and uh, I'm glad we're getting this in place. Um, I do have neighbors and constituents who are concerned about the uh, what what might happen, but I think uh, that we're always balancing the issues of different uh, groups of people in in town, and if there are problems, we will uh, revisit it. Lord, go ahead. Yeah, I'm grateful to city staff and everyone who did a lot of work on this. I'm excited to see this move forward, um, finally get these lockers we've been talking about for a couple of years. Um, so thanks to everyone who did that. I think the policy and everything accompanying it looks great. And, you know, as a pilot, we can learn and, and you know, continue to grow from there. Um, I, I do think just the point of congregation, you know, again, we need to have that other parallel conversation of you know what spaces are we creating for people in the community so this doesn't become a default space so that's on us to do that work um, and you know we need that commitment but I I think I heard uh, some momentum around that tonight so I think that will be kind of to me moving forward with this it's paired with the knowledge that that's also um, our intention. I, yeah, I agree with everything Lauren said. Thanks for the thoughtful work on this. I would just add, uh, since we have residences on either side of the building, if we haven't done already, maybe some proactive outreach there just to keep everybody in the loop. Your thoughts? Okay. Uh, so I will uh, say that I, I had some concerns about this location, and I was very curious about the possibility of putting it at the top of the Blanchard lot. It's good to know that there was, uh, that's a place where we store snow. You know, part of me does still wonder, like, do we have to use all of that space to store snow? Could, you know, this, could we, could we not do both uh, at the top there? But, I mean, to be fair, it is, I, I guess, what I am thankful for, to have heard tonight, too, is that it's a pilot, right? Like, we're, we're going to try it out and see if it works. Um, and I, I also not realized that it was on the opposite side from the bike path, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is helpful, but I am, and I'm glad that we're, we'll be adding lights to that side, but I would also just add that the side with the bike path is very dark. And mm -hmm. as somebody who cycles a lot, uh, especially at night, even, uh, I would love to see us put in lights on that side. That would be really helpful because that's a really scary stretch. It feels really close and um you just kind of say i'm i'm committed to biking through here whether there's lights or not uh but it is scary so uh, i'd like to just put that on people's radar if we're ordering lights let's let's put them all the way around Thank you. um yeah anyway um my toe any other thoughts Okay. All right. So there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? 
Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes. We will very much come back to you um, once this is set up and with a uh, check-in as soon as that gets going. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so now we are up to the uh, police review committee's uh, recommendations around public drinking and officer recruitment standards. And I know we have um, some presentations. So I'm going to, uh, at first year, turn things over to the chief. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm sorry. Good evening again, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, City Manager, Assistant City Manager, and uh, the public at large. Brian Pete with the Montpelier Police Department. And I'm going to um, uh, go over uh, two of the uh, items that were put in regarding the um, uh, uh, from the police review committee report. Oops, no, this is the wrong one. Ah, this one here. No, 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 trust me, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not that computer literate anymore. All right. uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, be before I begin, uh, uh, so in this, this particular segment, it's going to be regarding uh, public drinking, but I, I think that it's extraordinarily important for me to, um, to pretty much voice uh, the honest appreciation that the Montpelier Police Department has had for those who had volunteered their time and the hard work, um, the true hard work that they put into to, to a really good product that is helping us in developing our strategic goals and, and it's helping us to be more in tune with what it is that the community we serve wants from us. So we're looking to, to make sure to do our best to adhere to the spirit and, and, and doing our best to say yes to everything, but we want to make sure that we don't um, that there aren't uh, any unintended consequences that may relate to it. Uh, so, so with that being said, and then also I want to make sure that uh, to, to to make a clarifying uh, statement that uh, when I was up here talking about uh, the issue of the parklet, I take full responsibility. the 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 Montpelier Police Department has and always will continue to. Um, address any bad behavior or criminal behavior. It was just uh, through my direction. I had just asked officers to, if, if you don't have to deal with the situation that you see someone who is uh, uh, drinking in public, then let's hold off uh, before, so we can get some additional guidance. So um, that that's on, on me. So I just wanted to make sure, but, but to, to be extraordinarily fair that, that the Montpelier Police Department has and will always make sure that we continue to respond to anything that's gonna be a behavioral incident. So the uh, so the, sort of the points uh, or, or some of the, the items I'd like to talk to are uh, would be um, what the uh, the police uh, review committees or the PRC's drinking recommendations were, what MPD's position is, um, what the current ordinance is, how MPD enforces the current ordinance, and uh, then talk a little bit about uh, disorderly conduct, substance use disorders, and how they're baked into the law, and then the PRC's rationales and uh, MPD's responses to those. So foremost, if I can bring that down a little bit more, uh, the Montpelier Police Department has long modeled the PRC's values of prioritizing involvement when responding to acts related to criminal behavior for safety-related concerns. We we want, uh, I think one of the things that came out of the study was that the Montpelier Police Department is committed to 21st century policing and trauma-informed policing, and that we're not looking to, to utilize a hammer in situations that we don't need to utilize a hammer. That how we go about doing things is, is how do we go about helping people um, to the best of our ability, uh, and, and handling it at the lowest level possible without involving someone in the criminal justice system and knowing the difference between a mistake, uh, a, a bad decision at a time, and then what a malicious intent is. So we, we wholeheartedly agree with the spirit of what was recommended by the police review committee for um, uh, uh, drinking in public. And we want to acknowledge that we, we do not want to approach these things with a heavy hand. The recommendations in page on page six of the executive summary are listed there. Uh, I, I 
won't, I think that everyone here has read that, so I won't dive too much into it. It just talks about um, uh, consideration of, of repealing the ordinance, um, providing training uh, street outreach workers to our, uh, training to street outreach workers in Montpelier Police Department, uh, and then uh, then looking at the future committee to review all public safety ordinances, and that's something that we definitely want to make sure that we do as we bring out policies and, and what our strategic goals are. Um, well, I will say that we advocate that the ordinance uh, to remain in place, and again, that I think that, uh, that, that we do recognize intoxication as an illness. We do understand that substance abuse is an illness, and it's not a choice. Um, so that we want to make sure that our policies and procedures, as well as state law, that they ensure minimum involvement with the criminal justice system uh, in these cases. So what is the current city ordinance? The, the ordinance, uh, this is listed here, just talks about uh, no one person should consume an uh, open container of, carry a, um, an open container of malt liquor, a malt beverage, wine, intoxicating liquor in a public area. Um, one of the items that was listed uh, within the PRC a recommendation talked about that there was, um, that the, that the committee recognized that there might be a state law surrounding this. There is actually, I, I'm not aware of any state law re re revolving around actual consumption of alcohol in public. It's more or less the issues of disorderly conduct, what results from uh, consumption of an intoxicating substance. So how do we enforce the ordinance? So a typical call, um, and I say that extraordinarily lo loosely, um, usually there'll be a call for service or there'll be an officer's observation um, if someone is, is drinking in public. What the ordinance does is it gives us the ability to lawfully interact with someone uh, to see if there is intoxication or if there's a public safety concern, if there's a health concern, if there's anything that's going on. So without the ordinance, we don't necessarily have legal grounds to approach someone to determine if there's a behavioral issue or if there's a health issue or anything else to that effect. Um, the individual uh, usually abides by an officer's request to not drink in public. So most of the times it's like, excuse me, sir, ma'am, I'm so-and-so with the, with the Montpelier Police Department. Um, I just noticed that you're drinking in public. There's a, an ordinance, could you please not drink in public? Something to that effect. And most of the times that it, it just disperses by, by on its own right there. Uh, but if the situation warrants warnings that we're having conversations, then I, then I would argue that we've, we're already at a point of escalation that, um, that it is something that the Montpelier Police Department should be addressing before it gets to something that might be, that might, that has the potential of spiraling out of a control. So, uh, and, and again, in these cases, we would issue warnings, again, ask, 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 and then look at citations, uh, or if possible, if, if the situation escalates, because we're gonna do our best to de-escalate the situation, but it takes two, and if the, if the other party is escalating the situation, then there are other concerns that we have to look at. So we would, at this point, reach out to the person's support network, family members, is there somebody that can give you a ride? Is there some way that we can get you where you need to go um, and then look at service organizations again reaching out to good Sam uh, there is something uh, with turning point we do have a very good relationship right now with turning point a partnership uh, to the point that we're all trying to figure out grant funding that turning point can actually have someone on call so when we have these different types of situations if it doesn't warrant a police involvement how do we help these people and then how do we do that so currently right now we're doing like a referral system so if we run into someone we'll call turning point and we'll just say hey uh, xyz this is going on they'll do their reach out but if they do have someone on call then we can obviously reach out to them because sometimes it may not rise to the level of talking to someone or talking to a social worker um, if there is a clear safety concern, safety-related housing may be necessary, but I mean that. I mean that if someone's intoxicated to the point that there's a health issue, then we may have to lodge them uh, someplace so they can, with all due respect, sober up. So those are always the last options of citation, lodging, or arrest. So the state's law, uh, disorderly conduct, is listed here. All too often, our issue is, is again, it's not necessarily someone who's drinking in public, but it's the disorderly conduct that results because of consumption of alcohol or other intoxicants. So what the state law actually says about intoxication is that the state of Vermont recognizes that alcoholism and alcohol abuse are perceived as health and social problems. So ergo, this is baked into the system again, that alcoholics, uh, 
the language is a little dated, and alcohol abusers should no longer be subjected to criminal prosecution solely because of their consumption of alcoholic beverages. In other words, it's not the consumption, it's the behavior that may result of it. And that's, again, that's something that's baked into the system. So with all due respect, it, even if an officer wanted to be malicious and try to arrest someone for drinking in public, the law will not allow that to happen. So again, this is the sign, uh, defined as a health-related social problem, and we recognize this, and of course, this is what I believe is in the spirit of what the police review committee wants to do, is to make sure by right, because the police have a lot of, a lot of powers, and, and, and it needs to be checked, and we need to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable to it. So we want to make sure that we, we meet the spirit and that our culture enforces the spirit of what those recommendations are. So some of the rationales that were listed in the uh, the review committee talks about again um, uh, that the PRC had had the understanding that they cannot uh, looking at the, what the state law is, um, and then talking about deprioritization that we we can't really per se deprioritize a call if a call for service comes in we do have to respond to it there may be a ranking situation that officers are dealing with a critical emergency and then they will move to the next call as best as they can but we will go to all the calls for service that do come in I um, mean again uh, arrest citations those things are for last resort but what again our concern is looking at the behavior and as I mentioned before that we already do make references to good Sam and we're working with turning point and looking at what the criminal uh, conduct, we have long operated this way with what the spirit is. Um, that, um, but we also want to take caution that the community justice center, as well as uh, Good Sam, uh, it's e even though they may get involved into a certain situation, there, there's a process there, and it, it takes two again to reciprocate. So if the services are going out to the individuals, it's not going to be an automatic that the situation is resolved and everything is, is good because the social worker or the CJC is involved or uh, Turning Point or Good Sam. So uh, this this uh, this rationale that comes from the PRC regarding um, evidence with the ordinance and how it approves uh, public safety, that uh, I would say that all all laws were were designed, I think, were written in in a good faith, the majority of them, um, regarding trying to trying to keep public safety in mind, and they have all at one point or another <laughs> been broken. So it, it's, but it's our position regarding this is just that we, we need the tools to lawfully engage in someone before a behavior has the potential to escalate. And then the final one uh, talks about that the, uh, it was uh, opined that, uh, opined that uh, the ordinance disproportionately affects the, uh, the unhoused individuals with mental health problems. It's, it's our position that not everyone who is homeless uh, has, a, has a substance abuse issue, nor anyone, not everyone who is mentally, uh, has a mental health impairment is, is uh, susceptible to, to substance abuse issues as well. It, there, there's, there's scores of people, different categories of folks who are, um, who drink alcohol and, and or intoxicants for all different different reasons and I, and for us the the takeaway is that um, again it, it takes there's a de-escalation process and so as the officers or staff is working to try to de-escalate a situation that it's at that point if we're doing our jobs correctly um, then it's incumbent upon the individual that we're interacting with to also meet us at the same level so we'll never come in at a level 10 when we only need to be at a level one and we want to make sure that we give uh, the council our assurances on that and that we hold ourselves accountable to that. So the, the Montpelier Police Department and the PRC did not, I want to make sure this is clear, that the PRC did not imply that we do. Um, so, but I'm just putting it here that to give that, uh, that acknowledgement that, our, that your police department does not purposely or does not target homeless populations. We want to, again, make sure we just have the ability to proactively address any types of behavioral issues before they have the potential of spiraling out of control. And we do that in a trauma-informed way and understanding what substance abuse-related uh, illnesses are. And with that, um, can, we can, I can leave it here or then continue to move forward with the other, uh, the other topic. I feel like we should pause here and discuss this one. Yes, ma'am. All right. 
So questions for the chief. Lauren, go ahead. I'm just wondering, um, Justin Dreschler from the Police Review oh, Committee, yes. um, Alyssa, the chair, was unavailable. Okay. Um, I believe he was hoping to speak oh, to yes. just kind of explain a little more context on um, the PRC's kind of discussions and rationale and why we had put this in the report. Excellent. Um, I know I saw Justin on earlier. Justin, are you? Oh, he's got his hand up. OK, uh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Hey, everybody. For the record, Justin Dreschler from the Police Review Committee. Hey, Chief. Thank you for the presentation. So I, I talked to the uh, I talked to Alyssa about this a bit, and we just have a few responses. I guess the, having heard the chief full rationale, my first response is I'm not sure that you actually need the public drinking ordinance to approach individuals to begin with. I mean, any any citizen, any consensual citizen police encounter that's not a seizure is fine. And so the police can't walk up to someone and say, hey, you can't go anywhere. But they can walk up to someone and say, hey, they can't walk up to someone and say, hey, and then corner him or her and not let them move. And there are these, um, there are no bright line rules necessarily in these cases. But I don't see any reason why they would necessarily need the public drinking ordinance to approach people. Also, having said that, what is most troubling about this rationale is that it's, um, I mean, it's essentially a, stating out loud that this ordinance is just a pretext to increase the number of police citizen interactions, which is by definition a bad thing. Like, we don't want to give police the opportunity to engage in pretextual behavior. Um, and I, I, what I'm, I'm not saying that the police, that the MPD would engage in pretextual behavior, but I, I, I'm saying that that's essentially what they're asking for. They're asking to have this ability to go up and chat with someone who they think might commit a future crime. Uh, from our perspective, our perspective on the police review committee was always that the police have plenty of tools in their bag to deal with criminal behavior. And that the public drinking ordinance was number one, it was completely unnecessary because it wasn't even being uh, enforced. In 2020, had 12 public drinking ordinance citations, as the chief said. The courts have all dismissed them. Washington County State's Attorney's Office has absolutely no interest in prosecuting these things. So if we're not going to prosecute them, we're not going to cite them, and it only exists as a reason to approach people, like that should give everybody a lot of pause. It should be, give everyone a lot of concern, even if you have a great deal of faith, as the police review committee does, in our police department, because this police department is not going to be the same police department forever. Not the way that it works. Um, also, I have real concerns about this just being disproportionately used against the um, against the Garden Park residents, frankly. And I know that, that that may no longer be an issue. That may such residents may no longer exist after tonight. But the fact is, it, we didn't hear these concerns, or we heard some of them at the time that we were um, making these decisions in the committee. But there was not a ton of pushback. And then the MPD was neutral, and now they're against it. And the only difference that I see is that people over in Garrett and Park are causing trouble. And so the police want to be able to engage with them a little more. And I get that, and I get the tension. Um, but from our perspective, police intervention has never and will never be a solution to public drinking and substance abuse and mental illness and what have you. And we've tried this for many, 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 many years in many, 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 many places, and it's always failed. And so I, I suppose for all of those reasons, we think that it is a, a quite well-reasoned recommendation to repeal this ordinance, which you know, we're essentially being told is going to be weaponized against, against the homeless in this town. And by weaponized, I don't mean in necessarily a bad way. A weapon doesn't need to be used to, to really hurt somebody. But this is the weaponization of an ordinance. Like, there's just no other way to explain it. I'm not going to be talked to if, if I'm chugging a beer on Montpelier's um, sidewalks. I'm just not going to get talked to. It's not going to happen. And so what you're allowing is the police to make judgment of, judgments about who's going to be trouble and who's going to commit future crimes. Um, so, And I do think that we should hear. I do think that the, 
I do think that the city council should hear from the state's attorney's office on this issue. I do think they should hear from Carol Plant over at the TJC on this issue. Um, it's just the solution to these problems isn't more police. It's not. That's why we have all this good sand stuff, even if our police are the greatest, which God bless they are, but it's still not the solution. Um, I think Michael Sherman, who is also on the PRC, has some things to say about this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chief, as always. And thank you. I really appreciate the mutual respect, Chief. You know it's always there. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Michael Sherman, go ahead. Hi, I'm Michael Sherman. I was um, on the Police Review Committee, and um, actually, I was the one who did all the uh, most of the background research on this, and actually brought it to the attention um, of the chair and a few other people. Um, and it was because I was doing this the study on the uh, the patterns of arrest, and there was one year in the five years that we studied where there were twelve uh, where there were twelve arrests, and it didn't appear at any other year. For this, and so I asked, started the question: Well, why is it there, and why? What was what was responsible for the spike? I was never able to get an answer for why the spike took place because um, I was referred to uh, Captain Nordenson, who was on vacation at the time, and so we never got that. But but we did. I did have an exchange of of, of letters with the chief, and one of the thing, and in the in the letter from the chief, and I have it. Right here, I'm sort of feeling like, feeling like I'm looking like Senator McCarthy, but I'm not. Uh, um, he explained that in, if a citation is is made, and I think I've got this right, um, then the, that it automatically re kicked in a certain number, of, a certain kind of responses by the the police. They would they had to take the person to a detox center. If the detox center was full, it had to take that person back to town they would have to find some shelter and that basically was taking a police officer off duty or out of reach for a, a considerable amount of time um, and that this was um, and that it, it, it weakened the, the police force basically and and I, I as I say I have the the, the full letter it's a two-page letter in which um, it seemed like the, the chief was um, helping us make the case for maybe rethinking how, the, how to uh, deal with people who were, who were intoxicated. Now, I understand and I want to emphasize that context is, is everything. I'm a historian and, and that's the way I have to think. And so this was before, um, it was just a year ago. So we were in COVID, but it was certainly before the whole problem of the Girton Park uh, showed up. And I think that that has had a lot of, of that, that event has had a lot to do with the, the, ch the change in, in the police uh, attitude. And I, I appreciate that. And I, I think that, that, you know, we're t talking about a, a somewhat different situation. But I want to, mostly I want to em emphasize that I don't think the, that our committee was being irresponsible in proposing, in making this proposal. We were acting on information that we thought pointed to the need to find an alternative to uh, intervention with with a um, with a, with an arrest or even a citation, um, and would actually keep more police available for on duty work that uh, then then it would then it would um, then it would do any harm to the community. So I, I just and I don't want to get into a fight with the chief about this. I don't I don't think it's necessary, and I don't and I'm not meaning to contradict him or say that he that he contradicted us. Um, but I think it was either a miscommun a lack of communication or a failed communication in some ways, um, which led us to the conclusion that maybe the the ordinance itself was not uh, doing what it was supposed to do. All right. Thank you. Um, and actually, uh, so Lauren and Jack, you were both on oh, here. Uh, oh, uh, Bill, I think you got to mute yourself or something. Oh. There you go. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to offer a couple of comments, too. I think it is correct that when uh, the first police, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, you're good. You're I'm, I'm talking through that. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, during the first report from the police department, the, the official staff report was, this is a policy decision for the council. And I think it is a policy decision for the council. And I 
so now it's before you and we're sort of offering our thoughts on this where I, I don't think we meant to sort of give one message to the police review committee another message here so uh, and we've had more time to think about it I'm not sure that Girton Park is the only issue though and and I don't think that um, the, the police department will engage in any more or less citations because of, of this um, from my perspective and I think this is thinking of it more from a community or I guess I'd ask you to think about this from a community perspective more so than just the police review committee which is you know one of the things our ordinances do is set the standards for our communities and what is and isn't acceptable behavior and you know I think there was a lot of con justifiable concern about people needy people that may be drinking in public and you know my first thought was yeah great once we take this off a bunch of you know college kids are going to be sitting on the benches downtown and saying hey this is okay this is legal now this is this is fine in this community this is this is a, and one of the reasons well there may be many reasons why and we don't do this but part of it is we know it's not right it's not it's just not something that's a lot it's not a community standard and so i think as we seek to parse the very fine issues around marginalized people and they are real and we have to be conscious of that we also have to think about the standards we're setting for the entire community so you know I'll be honest I urge that we take the position in opposition to this the chief didn't so I don't want him to fall, fall on that sword um, so well, there we are if I may yeah. uh, so uh, in looking at that it's in the context, and again, I have to have to look at it. So I apologize if if, if I misrepresented in that email. In, in the context I'm looking for, but before I move into it, I think it's great. So I have a gr good spirited debate. Uh, I'm by no means upset or anything else like that. I, it, these are conversations that have to happen because we have to understand where, where each other is coming from, and this is how we're going to build trust and legitimacy as a as a police department. Um, so, but in in looking at that, I. The reasons why, and in looking at those numbers, again, there is a COVID consideration, but I think that part of the other reasons are that the low numbers of using that ordinance is, I would argue, is a testament to how the officers are handling these situations in the first place and that they're not overreacting or knee-jerk reacting by sending somebody to some place or writing citations on, on a consistent basis. And those citations that were dismissed by the courts were not dismissed upon the fault of the Montpelier Police Department or of the officers. They were just dismissed by the court um, for whatever priority they set in there. Uh, and then also in, in looking at uh, discussions with the uh, with the state's attorney's office, this is a municipal ordinance. This is handled by uh, uh, an attorney uh, hired by the city. So the Washington State's uh, attorney would not be involved in a, a simple citation for drinking in public. They would only be involved in situations in which somebody was, there was a disorderly conduct charge that normally accompanies, is the end result of someone who is consuming too much alcohol uh, or any intoxicant in the other. So, um, so I would just uh, also put that uh, also there as well. And um, those are the only notes that I have at this point. Okay. Great. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Well, uh, yeah, actually, thank you. Uh, Lauren and Jack, I know you were on that committee as well. Do you want to make any comments about, about this? Yeah. Just, just, I guess, you know, one area that I think we kept coming back to and that even hearing the kind of scenarios you were describing, Chief, like it feels like the interactions that are problematic or the times where it becomes problematic is when it is escalating into a situation that you still would have every right to be engaging with someone because it's only when there is a disorderly conduct or something otherwise the there isn't you know why why would the police be involved if if people are just you know not having any kind of concern so i guess i'm still trying to parse out the you know, when are you all interacting with people just on the public drinking ordinance in a way that's helpful to the community that's not a situation that is kind of edging into or at a disorderly conduct or some other criminal where you, of course, are going to be involved and have it's a whole different conversation? Uh, to answer that, ma'am, I, I think that 
I'm going to make the assumption that, in my experiences, that laws of these nature were not designed by the police. They were just enforced by the police with the assumption that that folks who tend to take intoxicants, that will often lead to another behavior. So it's a proactive issue. And then I would also say that, um, that in, in those interactions that they may not be documented because of the officer going to a meeting with an individual and saying, excuse me, sir, ma'am, you're, you're not allowed to drink. Okay, fine, it's great. There's no reason to, to, to move any other, have any other further conversations or anything else like that. We're not gonna do name checks or anything else to that effect or detain that person. So I would just say that, that law enforcement enforces the laws on the books and then my, my position there would be those laws were made um, with the assumption that they want to, we need to enforce them fairly and correctly in, a, in an approach, but um, in, in doing it responsibly, but we also understand the outcome. I mean, because I would look at it again, like what's another, we could name any law out there. And, and as I mentioned before, laws have been bro being broken every day. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we're harassing folks or, or having contact with folks in certain different ways. Thank you. Jack, anything you want to add? Not at this point, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Donna, go ahead. So my question has to do with the difference between alcohol and other drugs. Indeed, we don't have on the books things about other drugs to be over the limit and then for our concern. We only have it about their behavior that might be caused by other drugs. Why is alcohol different? Why would we need a separate ordinance? I, I would I would think that it looks to me that when this ordinance was created, it was done in in, in what there was no distinction between alcohol being an actual drug, which is what we know it to be now. So alcohol is con considered a drug. Right, but I can sit on the bench and smoke marijuana now. Yes, but that's that. If I may intervene, I'm yeah, sorry, go ahead, but go ahead. I think the pr you're there. That the presumption was, I think. Alcohol has always been legal, or at least since the 30s, and um, the other drugs aren't. So just basic possession of them was in and of itself a crime or, or something, yeah. um, whereas you can legally possess and consume alcohol. So the, the town, the city at the time said, yeah, but you can't do it in public. Like, that's not a standard that we want you to have. And I believe, actually, I'm not sure where the Vermont is on you can buy and use retail, but it lasts. I'm not sure you can consume the public. You cannot. What's that? Yeah, you, I'm not sure. Not for able a while, you weren't able to smoke it in public. So I don't know where that has ended up. But so you know, and if that's the case, then that will be a new state statute. I, I think it's really so. I just ask you to think about if you guys are okay. If if we're okay for the that's the standard for the community that you can hang out on a public bench or wherever and drink beer or whatever, then that's great. I'm just, I think it's just important to remember that these are setting a standard for everybody, not just uh -huh. some people. So, sorry, Donna, was there anything no, further? No, 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 thank you, Bill. OK, um, Connor, go ahead. Just following up on Bill's point there, um, and I, I don't want to be alarmist, but I'm trying to think of like an extreme example. Like 3rd of July, people are sitting, watching the parade for like up to five hours at a time. They bring like a bag of cans with them, and it turns State Street turns into Bourbon Street all of a sudden. It's a, that that's a, that's a possibility with us. Okay, Carrie, and then Lauren. Um, so just to follow up on that, people are definitely drinking at the Third of July parade already. <laughs> so <laughs> we should not kid ourselves about that. Um, so, so I just I just want <laughs> I just want to address um, and and thank you for all of the other pieces that were part of the recommendations that you're that the Montpelier Police Department is already doing. You know, treating people like human beings, offering assistance when needed, trying to connect people to resources. Thank you so much for that. I have um, I'm very very happy about that. I am I'm getting just a little hung up on looking at the what the state law says and reconciling that with the city ordinance. And I don't know if this is something that you can address or if somebody else can address it, but that that this state law that says it's a policy that alcohol um, will is a so health and social problem and that 
that alcoholics and alcohol abusers, so people using alcohol, shall not be subjected to criminal prosecution solely because of their consumption of alcoholic beverages. That seems pretty clear to me that an, that an ordinance that says the fact that you consumed alcoholic beverages is not allowed, that seems to me like it's incompatible with the state law. And maybe this is a question that a lawyer can answer better for me, but that's the thing that I'm that I'm kind of stuck on. And so if this is, is this enforceable? Is this something that we can actually have on our books, um, given what the state law says about it? And if not, then we should really think seriously about why we have it. So I would I would uh, respond to that one that yes it is something that you can have on the books and that while the state is looking at it, it's not necessarily no one's saying that we're we're going to lock up anyone because they're they're consuming alcohol there, there's a certain standard of, of behavior and I think that this is this is one of those things that you're going to have unintended consequences for and again I would also point back to the fact that the department is not taking this just like any other law i could you, you can name a law and again the, the department police officers don't create laws we enforce the laws that that legislative bodies put on and they're put there for a reason so we don't go out and abuse any which any which one of them that's not who we are and that's not what we're about and that's not what a majority of of law enforcement is about and and and, and i say that because one of the catalysts behind the creation of the prc was because of what other law enforcement agencies are doing elsewhere. Um, so so I, I would just say that whatever the council decides is what we're going to do. Um, but this is a standard, I think, for the community. And, and how, with all due respect, what's to stop me if someone calls me on the phone and says, there's someone who's sitting outside of my uh, my house, or they're sitting outside of of, of Aubuchon's, or they're sitting outside here and they're drinking alcohol, which is what what's what's going on right now. So my only option is there's nothing to do. Let's wait till they get drunk and they break something. Other than that, I have no no other recourse to talk to that person to see where that person's at to see if there's anything I can do to help that person. So and and so I and, and I do understand the the caution that uh, that Justin had brought up regarding. Um, police accountability, but I also, on a personal note, I could I could look at that again and say that we need to be cautious of what powers I guess that we're giving police because whether the department is doing something good now, there's still like a presumption that in the future the department can can flip, and I would argue that that this city body would not allow that to happen. That you're going to look to hire the right people, the right person to sit in this chair, and that I'm going to make sure that I hire the right people who are going to acknowledge and who are going to be supportive of what the decisions that the city council makes as far as what our community wants. If you don't want to police the way our community wants to police, then you don't belong with the Montpelier Police Department. And I think that's a standard that, that has long been set here in this department, and I think that's a standard that's been set uh, from the top. Okay. Any, any other communities in uh, Vermont not have this on the books, do we know? I do not know the answer to that question. Please review, maybe. Maybe those guys know. Michael Sherman knows. Michael Sherman. Oh, I don't know. I feel like that. Um, all right. Uh, oh, Jack. And then, and then I want to go to the public. You can go to the public. Now. Okay. All right. Uh, so if you are in person, you get to go first. Go ahead. Steve Whitaker again. Um, keep in mind that we've been doing for a couple of years now these uh, parklets. Uh, all the restaurants are serving alcohol out in public in the streets. And this this is kind of like uh yeah, it's not a big you, you can drink in public as long as you're patronizing a restaurant but if you're too poor to patronize the restaurant then we want to have our stick that we can bring down on you uh just just think about it it's it's pretty absurd uh i hear this build trust and legitimacy as a pd uh you will you will acknowledge the mistake the error of stealing billy's unopened beers 
And until you do, you're not going to hear the end of it. Uh, Billy's still in town, and you can replace, you can make restitution, and you can return his beers because you have no credibility on this topic as long as you steal and lie, and your department does as well. Um, we need the tools. I, I want to appreciate uh, the police review committee comments from uh, Mr. Dreschler that, that we're setting up this pretext so that we can, you know, harass. I brought to your attention, and you never did anything about it nor even discussed it, the brother who came in back into town to grieve his dead brother, who was an AP photographer, and three police officers converge on, on them having a beer up. It, was, it wasn't even public property. It was uh, national life property. And that kind of harassment is, is routine around here. You know? So they didn't need any pretext there. They're, you know, opening, they're, they're relying on their open beverage. But, uh, yeah, harassing people on private property with three officers, stealing the open beers. Those are fatty daddies, by the way, the 16 or 20 ounce fatty daddies when you need to make good on your restitution. Um, trauma informed way, there's a lot of buzzwords and a lot of double speak, but we, this this unequal enforcement is is creating trauma in the community. You know, it's to neglect enforcement of the littering and neglect enforcement of the speeding or the diesel trucks whatever they're called that you know blast through town at high volumes we don't enforce any of that but we want to be able to enforce on the poor people for having an open beer i just think it's it's further hypocrisy and it lack of uh engagement and, and responsibility lies with the council to clean this up so i support the police review committees and again, it's, insist that you get a police oversight commission in place that could actually dig into these things that they've swept, that you help sweep under the rug. Okay, um, any other comments? Okay, all right. Uh, and so we'll go to folks who are with us digitally. Uh, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Uh, I guess I have a question. I'm not much of a drinker um, and I'm not a dope smoker. Um, but in this conversation, I do think you're going to need to think a little bit ahead to dope smoking. But what is the difference between having a beer outside in three penny op, three penny tap room, having a beer watching a ball game, having a beer sitting in Guerton Park, having a beer sitting on your own door steps in a in a building that is more or less downtown? I don't quite understand Bill's point about community standards. If there's a community standard about drinking beer or wine, whatever, but let's just say drinking beer outside in town, where do you draw the line? Why is this ordinance, why does this ordinance exist? Who would, who's it going to be enforced against and not against? And there was a case in New York City a couple of years ago of, of a guy who was arrested for drinking a beer on his own stoop. I can't remember how that was resolved, but that's sure to happen. I, I, I ask those questions honestly. I think it's something you got to think about and think ahead a little bit because you're going to have the same problem with smoking dope. Thank you. Oh yeah, go ahead and then we'll go so, to Jack. So there's, there's a major fundamental difference. Um, at Parklets, at the ballpark, any place like that, those are licensed establishments. Um, that are serving licensed by the city, by this, the State Liquor Commission. They have licensed servers. They have, they're have they subject to their own liability for over-serving and those sorts of things. So when you're sitting at a parklet, you are actually you know within the, uh, a legally established boundary that has been set by liquor control, and you're not un, you know, pouring yourself unlimited beverages. You're being served by supposedly a responsible server. Now, I realize that's a point of debate, but you're in what's considered a controlled environment. The difference between that and you know, your own stoop, I see that point, I don't know, we don't really have much of that, but that's a fair point. Um, a person sitting by themselves with whatever supply they choose to bring, whether it's beer or whiskey or anything else, and just pounding it till they're silly, um, is not a controlled environment. It's not 
liquor license control and it's not uh, there's not an assumption that there is a responsible party for what's happening so there, there's a big difference in, in that regard and again i'm you know i, I personally i have my own personal opinion but i think it's just i'm trying to make sure the council thinks about all the aspects of this um and, and you're right when you know as as uh, cannabis comes into play we're gonna have to learn the rules for that too um and if 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 we're okay with it we're okay with it and that's fine but it's it's i think we've narrowed this conversation down to you know some people and i think all i'm saying is just remember it would apply to all people uh, in all circumstances um, if we say it's okay to drink in public in unregulated places at any time anywhere that would that's what getting rid of this ordinance would be saying um, Jack, if you have something you want to follow up with, that's fine, and then we'll go to Justin. Thank you. Yes, I, I was going to say a lot of the same thing that Bill was saying, including that uh, if you're drinking at uh, the park that operated by a bar, one thing they're not supposed to be serving you if you're intoxicated, and, uh, and there is some regulation and limit to that. Um, I have, uh, I was on the Police Review Commission, and I supported this proposal. Um, I have some. Uh, I'm having second thoughts. I'm not sure where I uh, where I come down. I uh, I, I think I've, I'm hearing some good points, um, really on both sides. But I am hearing some good points on uh, the idea of some. Keeping leaving the police to still have some uh, authority to uh, for oversight, and so I'm not a hundred percent sure where I would go um, with this. As as I understand legally where we stand, if we were to uh, move vote to uh, support the uh, recommendation of the commission, then our next step would be to uh, Put put a repeal proposal on the on the uh, on a future agenda with public uh, public notice because we repeal and amend or amend ordinances the same way we enact ordinances. Fair enough. Oh, lots of thoughts. I'm still going to go to Justin and then uh, to the chief and then to Donna and then Vicky Lane. <laughs> okay. Just very quickly, and I, I can't, I don't know if anybody mentioned this, and I'm sorry if you did, um, but the ordinance specifically did not apply to Hubbard Park. It's written right into it. So you can sit in Hubbard Park and get cocked all day long right now. Nothing anybody can do about it. And do we see people doing that? And I think the answer is no. And so why do we think that that's going to happen downtown? If there are plenty of places that people can already drink in public in Montpelier at will, why do we think it's all of a sudden going to turn into some hellscape downtown? I think it's a question that we should be asking. That's all I got. Okay, thank you. Um, to the chief and then Donna. So I would pose an existential question. With all due respect, with the spirit of what the council tasks the PRC to do, what in the grand scheme of things does an ordinance of public drinking have to do with policing in Montpelier? And I would argue that what that boils down to, to me, the spirit of it is, is, is there faith and is there trust in the department that the department is going to behave and, and, in a professional manner and apply the laws correctly? Because I can, theoretically, I can abuse anyone with any law and beat that over their heads. So whether, so if, if the answer is, well, the police can go ahead and, 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 and go after homeless people or other people because they're drinking, or you get rid of the ordinance. Well, who's to say I won't pick a new ordinance? Huh? Litter. Someone brought up litter. Oh, I can go after somebody for littering now. Oh, I can go after somebody for the next thing. What it boils down to is the professionalism and the culture that is set by and the standards and the expectations of, of our community, our elected body, and what you all dictate to us to do. And that is how we're going to go to, to go about moving things. So I don't think that the answer is that because the police department can abuse a law on the books, you get rid of the law to minimize the opportunities that the police can abuse someone else to, in, in the future. 
then if that's the case, then get rid of the police department or hire the right people to do the job that are going to enforce the cultures and the values that you set for this community. Okay, thank you. Uh, Donna. I'm really slow understanding the ramifications here and taking what Bill said, I'm thinking about when I went to New Orleans and they have what they call open container everywhere. And likewise in Las Vegas, you walk around the street, you can have your drinks. Is that the, the big difference if this ordinance would then not allow people to do that? And without it, we will ha then have people walking down the sidewalks with their drinks and, and open beer containers? Well, I would also- I could. We could. We well, no, but, the, but, but literally when I think I shouldn't do this, this is the law that's there to sort of remind me I shouldn't do it. Well, yes, ma'am, and that, okay. that is, and, and again, like, are there people drinking in Hubbard Park? Absolutely, there are people slamming beers in, in, in Hubbard Park. Yes. Um, but, yeah. but I would also, again, to, 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 to uh, city manager's uh, proposal to the council, it, it depends on, on the standards or the expectations that we have of the community. And in the Montpelier Police Department, I will salute smartly and do whatever it is that I'm told to do. And, and, and I will be professional about it. I, I'm, I'm on neither, neither side of the fence. My advice is there are unintended consequences that come to this, but I'd pose another existential question. When you go to Las Vegas or when you go to Beale Street in Memphis, when you, do you bring your kids? Mm. Yeah. Then that is the potential <coughs> amount of behavior that you can. I'm not trying to be an alarmist by doing by saying that, but I'm, I think that it's ultimately, can people break the laws? Yes, but there's still a standard. There's still something that the community is saying, we as a community realize that this has the potential to spiral into something else, and we don't want to do that. But, but then why is the parks exempt? I know people like have alcohol with their picnics, but really talk about an area that shouldn't, and most state parks I've been in, say no alcohol. I didn't realize ours didn't. <laughs> I, I didn't, we just enforce what you tell us to do. Yeah, it's interesting. Wow. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to go to uh, Vicki Ann Lane, then Michael Sherman. I, uh, since you're on the committee, I'll let you um, speak again. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge the time. I would like to be wrapping up, um, you know, meaty conversation at at least by 10. Uh, which uh, I'm just going to put out there. I think what that means is that we're not going to get to the conversation about um, the recruitment or the re um, minimum hiring requirements. Uh, and I've already been in touch with um, Shana to say I, I don't think we're going to get to the um, social and economic justice uh, presentation this evening. So, uh, but just just a heads up for folks uh, where where we're going for the rest of the, the evening. Um, right, having said that, uh, Vicki Ann Lane, go ahead. Um, I would just prefer to keep the uh, open container law the way it is. Um, I cannot tolerate being around drunk people. Um, and that would be the same for people that are high on whatever. Um, I do I mean, I, I recognize that there are people in town um, that have uh, a alcohol, alcoholism as an illness. And yes, I do come in contact with them. But um, I, uh, I don't want to walk down the street and see people um, drinking their drinks or or having drank a few too many and behaving in a in a way that um that is very uncomfortable to me or uncomfortable to someone who has a child with them um i just i prefer the open container law stay the way it was i thought that was relatively workable um so, uh, you know. Great. Thank you, Vicki. Um, Michael Sherman, and then we'll go to Don Little. Okay, I think there's a problem about what, what th there are two things going on at the same time, and we're not making a, a sufficient distinction between them. One is intoxication, 
and the other is behavior which is either bad behavior or criminal behavior or destructive behavior. And the law doesn't make that distinct. The law, as is written, doesn't make that distinction, but it's an important distinction. The law, and I'm going to quote from Chief Pete's letter to me of May 24th, 2021. The state has a law that requires law enforcement to place an intoxicated person into protective custody and take them to a detox facility. Okay. Um, and then I'm just going to go down a couple of paragraphs. Additionally, when we encounter someone who is intoxicated, just intoxicated, um, the state law requires we take them into detox. For us here, Washington County Mental Health Services has a detox facility in Berlin, the lighthouse, but the facility has requirements on who can be brought in, nonviolent, et cetera, and a good amount of those we encounter may not meet those requirements. If that happens, MPD is on the hook. If we pick someone up and the lighthouse won't take them, then where do we go from there? Do we bring them back to the department? If an officer had to stay with that person or transport them to another location, it leaves one officer back in the city to respond to emergency calls and service for service. That's why the committee made its, its recommendation. There's a difference between being intoxicated and acting violently, maliciously, irresponsibly, dangerously. And, the, and I think if you're going to do anything, you should, I think, in my opinion, you need to make that distinction in the ordinance itself. It's not just intoxication. Is the, in, that's not, should not be the issue because of all those consequences. If state law requires the police to act in one way just because a person is intoxicated, You'll never solve the problem of not having enough police on service because they'll be constantly bringing people to detox centers, which they which are already full, and then you have to do something else with them. That's why the committee made that recommendation. Thank you, um, Don Little. Go ahead. Um, I do agree with a lot of what Michael just said. That that I I do think there are a lot of wasted time and resources potentially for picking up people who are intoxicated. And it would be ideally behaviorally based. I did miss a lot of the discussion, so I'm not going to come down really hard on either side of this. But I did want to take the opportunity to mention that not always true in the past, but over the last few years, I have been very impressed by the Montpelier Police Department response to people who are intoxicated. I think that with the one exception that Stephen Whitaker mentioned earlier, I think just about every interaction I've seen between the police and people who are intoxicated has been incredibly compassionate, incredibly efficient. Um, so I don't have any, you know, at the moment, I, I really feel good about the way they're responding to that. But I would hate to see a lot of time wasted on unnecessarily unnecessary police involvement in situations that are not either dangerous to the person medically or behaviorally dangerous to those around them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, anyone who has not spoken yet? Okay, all right, so back to council. What are your thoughts on this? Lauren, go ahead. I mean, a couple things I'm thinking about. I mean, I really appreciated the way that Chief walked through how you're actually dealing with these situations. And part of me is wondering if we could kind of have a written policy that, I don't know if it already is a written policy or this is just the culture as you talked about and how people are trained and, and doing it. And I'm really you know encouraged to hear all of the input from community members of how that's playing out um, you know, in the community for people. I mean, it, it, to me, it seems like in large part, what it sounds like you're doing is what the police review committee wanted, wants the outcomes to be. And there's the potential of um, if that's not being followed, that there's you know ways that just alcohol consumption in and of itself doesn't feel like the right venue to be entering the criminal justice system potentially, or you know whereas disruptive behavior, you know the, the behavior that can result from intoxication can and and in our assessment already gives you plenty of tools to engage with people, but you know I'm, I'm just wondering between a policy accompanying the ordinance that lays out in writing that what it sounds like you're already doing um, and or if there is a way of tightening up the ordinance language that has to deal more with 
um, intoxication or a, a different kind of level than just you know, I mean, some of these extreme examples, like, I don't think we're going to turn into New Orleans or, or any of that because, um, you know, people can already drink at Hubbard Park. We haven't turned into New Orleans and the parks. But, um, you know, so I'm just, it seems like maybe there's a path here that's kind of essentially codifying in some way the practice that it sounds like you're already doing. And how do we just ensure that that's what's carried forward and through leadership changes and, um, you know, that it's crystal clear to everyone in the community, what are the expectations from the community and um, from your the police department of how to respond in situations and you know when it would and wouldn't be um, appropriate to kind of be using this ordinance if i may say something just just very quickly in regards sure. to um the my when i brought up the incident and yes ma'am def, definitely we can we can definitely uh enshrine that um but in going back to that email my my frustration and, and May, I, I should have made it a little bit clearer, and I apologize about that context. But my frustration with the law that, that requires law enforcement to do the detox facilities is frustration that there is a law that puts the liability onus on the city to take responsibility for someone who's in, in, a, in a state that, that's unfortunate, that, that, that poses a significant possibility of health risk to themselves. So that's where my frustration is. Even if the law, the, the ordinance is, is, is gotten rid of, we're going to have to do that anyway. So I'm still frustrated with the fact that that is there, that that onus is on us to, to be an adult to someone who cannot hold their, their alcoholic intake. Um, so I'll jump in here too. I mean, I, I think about this from the perspective of folks who are uh, recovering alcoholics and who do not want to be around uh, alcohol. And so open containers uh, uh, could be a significant source of, uh, you know, temptation or just could be really hard to be around and to maintain their, their own goals you know if they're uh, as it is right now they could they could say well i'm not I'm not going to the bar i'm not you know going to places where alcohol is served and that's not necessarily the case if folks are uh just out uh in in public with it um and i so i i'm i'll, I'll just say for for me this this is um not a step that i'm ready to take um but I am just one person on the council. Other thoughts? Yes, Carrie. Um, okay, so I think there are, I am feeling like there are a lot of intersecting things here. Um, and I, so I appreciate, um, I appreciate Bill's point about, we're thinking about kind of our community standards here. And do we wanna be a community where people can drink a beer on the sidewalk? Where we are a community where people can drink a beer at Hubbard Park, where they can drink a beer at their kid's little league game, where they can, it, if oh, I, yeah, or it's true. not school sponsored. Right. So yeah, um, where, where, you know, the rec soccer games at the Dog River Field, people can be drinking. Um, so, and, and we're not Bourbon Street. And I do think it's alarmist to invoke images of Bourbon Street. Um, I did go there last summer. There were a lot of kids on Bourbon Street, <laughs> and it's a, it, there are a lot of reasons why it may or may not be a place I would want to take my kids, but um, that don't apply in Montpelier. So, in general, my bias, my personal bias, is going to be a, a way um, against criminalizing behavior that we don't have to criminalize. And so, alcohol is legal. Um, I can. I can drink in my own home and I can get completely wasted and then step outside and stagger down the street. And, um, and I'm not, and that's not, I'm not publicly drinking, I drank at home. But then my behavior becomes a public issue. And so it's, I, I think that's the responsibility of the community and the police to be thinking about what's the problematic behavior. And so if I'm stumbling down the street and I'm yelling obscenities at my neighbors because I'm intoxicated, that is a problem. But if I am sitting quietly on a park bench and quietly, you know, intoxicated, that's not necessarily causing a problem. It's not a public safety issue. So I would, in general, I would like 
us to be focusing on the problematic behavior and trying to address that. So there's the disorderly conduct, there's what people are doing when they are, uh, when they have been drinking. And not assuming that any drinking is going to result in illegal behavior. And the chief brought up the question of, do we want to wait until somebody becomes so drunk that then they engage in problematic behavior before the police step in and do anything? And I mean, I, I would, yes, like you to do that. I would like us not to be um, engaging with people in a criminal justice kind of a way if they're not doing anything that's not a danger to public safety. And I don't think that in general, public drinking is a danger to public safety. It's the behavior that can result from that. And I think we do have tools to deal with that. And if we don't, I think we would be seeing a lot more problems in the vast areas of the city where public drinking is allowed. So I don't, I don't really have um, a very strong feeling about what we should do in response to the police review committee, because I do feel like there are a lot of people in the community who um, have a, might have different standards, and I'm very respectful of that. Um, so this isn't going to be my hill to die on, but um, I do want us to be really conscious about when we make choices to, to outlaw behavior that is otherwise legal, we need to be extremely, extremely thoughtful about that. Thank you. Jack, go ahead. I think that there's, um, as I said before, I think there are arguments on both sides that have some validity to them. But uh, whatever those arguments are, I think that uh, they deserve to have uh, to be fully aired with the uh, notice to the public and public hearings before this body. So I move that we uh, place on a future agenda a proposal to repeal the uh, public drinking ordinance. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a second. Further discussion? Uh, Connor. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say I haven't spoken too much. I, I, I'm on the fence. I can't believe I'm on the fence on this one, actually. <laughs> but I, I kind of am. It's, uh, I mean, I want to, like, I'm having trouble reconciling the idea that we'd consider this after a move we made a couple agenda items ago, which largely was due to public feedback on Garden Park. And then I'm trying to be honest with myself at the age of like, you know, 23, 24, when I moved to town, do I trust myself with an ordinance like this? Uh, nobody drank as much as I did in my 20s, I guarantee you that. And if I was going to go to like McGillicuddy's, you better believe I'd be pre gaming and I bring a bottle of Jameson with me all the way down State Street. There, I go nothing but net. I drink more in there, you know, and then I probably buy another bottle for the walk home. You know, this was my behavior in my 20s, and I definitely would have done it if it was legal and I knew nobody could stop me for it. So, um, yeah, again, generally good for decriminalizing like most things. And I do see some logic in, you know, when you talk ordinances, we're going beyond you, chief. I don't trust the police chief 10 years from now. I don't trust the council then. So there's a <laughs> level of permanency in an ordinance, right? So I'm all over the map. Maybe we need to talk more. So I'll vote for public turn. I am with Carter, it's like 150%. Me in my 20s, yeah we would have been together, so. <laughs> Tana. I just don't feel comfortable with the intention to, your intention of a hearing is to repeal it. And I'm not ready to repeal it. I'm ready to have a lot more discussion. So to have that as a preset attitude that we're having these hearings to re, not just modify it, but to repeal it, um, I'm not comfortable with it. And I wasn't bringing up Bourbon Street or New Orleans um, or Las Vegas as uh, alarmist. It was just my own reality, how different I felt in those communities, watching people all around me, even when I walked two miles from the base chaos with beer and drinks everywhere. It was just very different mindset than on my own hometown. So that's why I brought it. It was a huge contrast all of a sudden of a community standard. And the community standard, I think, impacts not having beer in the parks. And maybe when we review it, if it can be more positioned as a review, then maybe we'll look at the parks and look at the rec fields, etc. That's all. I'm definitely not going to vote in favor of repealing <laughs> it. 
at this point. I, at this point, I'm not voting in favor of repealing it, but I am voting in favor of having <clears throat> putting it on the agenda so we have further discussion. And so that's why I phrase the uh, the motion the way it is because I think that's how we get get it on the agenda to have the discussion. But so it would be just so I'm clear for the action, it would be to put the first reading for repeal of the ordinance on an agenda. Okay. Yes, Chief. Go ahead. Should I also work on the enshrinement for the for the policy and interacting with um uh and to enshrine that into a policy situation? Go ahead, Lauren. I, so I seconded the motion. I mean, I'm kind of in Donna's camp. Like, I do wonder if there's a way of wording it in a way that is, I feel like there's paths that are, my sense of the council is, I don't know that we're going to repeal it. It feels like maybe we'll make some adjustments. And so does putting it out and getting a really, um, you know, the gut reaction from the community about this versus what the real conversation I think is of you know what are we doing are there adjustments to be made is kind of how I feel like the conversation has gone more so I could yeah. we friendly amend the well, <laughs> well a question for Bill um, if you know would we would we be satisfying the uh, provisions of state law if we just Put on the agenda consider whether to repeal the ordinance or consider taking a action on the uh, or public drinking ordinance so there's, a, I, cup, there's a couple things you can do first of all our, our ordinance adoption practice our, our ordinance adoption requirement in the charter only calls for one public hearing in adoption we've always traditionally done two and I think it's best practice and we should continue to do that just because so um, you could have a, your first reading could be to consider amendments. The other thing we've done in the past is just put the topic on and talk about the alternatives and to come up with what you want. If you want to amend it, then what goes on. So it wouldn't be, then you'd still have to have the hearings, but you'd have another meeting to, to consider what amendments, if any, you're going to make to propose and then put those on for first reading. That's probably the safest way. But whatever you want to do is, and you can always, you can have the first reading and not pass it. You can have the first reading and, a, a, you know, the, the first reading could be to repeal it all and then that gets amended to, we're just going to amend it to this instead and have your second reading on that. So, you know. so I'm sorry, are you suggesting that we could, we, um, we could have it on the agenda just as a topic, yes. not necessarily as a hearing? As, as often as you yeah, wish. that is that was my understanding as well. Is that we we can have we can absolutely put it on the agenda just as something to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, like, like today. Yeah. Right. Yes. I move to amend or to amend my motion to do that. Second. Okay. So we're voting on the amendment <laughs> to do that, <laughs> which is just have a discussion <laughs> about it. If I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay. Further discussion about that. That sounds great. Okay. Yes, Lauren. Well, just one question. So back to the chief's question. I mean, do other people think that, because it obviously would take time of the chief and the team to do the work. So if I'm the only one who wants that, then I, so I just, like, is there a broader sense, or should we wait until that discussion before? Like, I could see that as an alternative proposal to amending the ordinance if we're like, oh, that gives me great comfort that in the policy, Possibly, but um, I I just want to be responsive to the chief's question of if that's a good use of the team's time in the interim before we take up the public discussions more. I mean, I, if uh, you're comfortable with that uh, I, idea, I am much more interested in enshrining that kind of uh, policy rather than changing the ordinance. I'm speaking for myself. Yes, ma'am. The, the only thing that our that our folks would need is is just. We just need direction. What do you want us to do when someone calls us and says X, Y, Z is going on? And yep. we just need that defined. I think for now, it's what we're doing. Um, I, so I, I would also say, just to say it out loud in front of everyone, I, it's going to be a while. Unless you want to expedite this, it's going to be a while. We, we've, we have been habitually pushing things off, and we pushed a couple more off tonight. And 
right now the, the meeting list for the next meeting is extremely long, which tells me other things are going to have to get pushed off. So, um, you know, in terms of the chief having time to write a policy, you know, this may be one of these late June or July things before it comes back. I'm just trying to be realistic because there's just a huge backlog. That's okay. Yep. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, it doesn't feel urgent to me to have a written policy right now. I, I feel pretty confident about how things are actually happening. I do think that um, that could be something that came out of a discussion or, you know, a couple of discussions down the road that we could, the city council could make a formal request or a recommendation or direction for some kind of a policy as opposed to getting rid of the ordinance. I also don't feel... Um, a great sense of urgency time-wise to get this taken care of right away because I do feel very confident in the way things are being handled right now by the police department. So I don't see, I think it's okay. That that makes sense yeah. to me that that could, that could be something that comes out of a discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay with you, Lauren? Okay. Great. So, so no on the writing of policy right now. Okay. Um, but we still have a, a motion and a second on the floor to to put it on the um, well some future agenda. So, question. A motion to amend. Yes, exactly. So we got to do both. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all right. So on the amendment to take it up at a future meeting. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, uh, and so now we're voting on the motion to take it up at a future meeting. Okay, um, all, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. We appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. And um, I also want to thank the Police Review Committee for all your work on this. Uh, it is worth talking about. So, yeah, it's, uh, I appreciate your uh good thinking about all of this okay so we are not doing the officer recruitment standards uh or the social and economic justice advisory committee stipend policy uh, i do feel like we could talk about a rep to the montpelier live board anybody want to do that <laughs> council member erickson had been our rep asking if they could have one they would like one yes we should have one Yes, Jack. Um, when this is a board that meets uh, during regular working hours, I assume. I think so. Okay. Is that five o'clock? <sighs> yeah, I thought so too. I'm not 100% certain. It's you know it's there. Well, Justin Drexler was on, and he used to be on the board. If he's still here, maybe he can help us a little. It looks like he just I don't left. See him. He just went off. Okay. Uh anybody interested or should we find out when it meets yes. uh, the, the face lauren is like you're thinking about it i would need to know when it meets okay it's feasible with my schedule. okay all right we will find out when it meets okay uh all right on to council reports um donna you are up okay um thing oh shoot. Shoot, 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 shoot we can come back to you no it's late no let's just oh, you'll come back if i think of it but anyway. okay all right thank everybody for being here and participating and and dealing with the two minutes much better than usual we averaged three three and a half it was good it's good it's good uh yes just real quick the board for montpelier alive meets monthly on the second tuesdays from 5 30 to 7 30. okay with that information, Sorry. second Tuesday, 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, who's up for that? I might be able to, but I have to look at my COSA caseload to see if I have any on Tuesday evenings. Okie dokie. Uh, so can we revisit that next time? Yes. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, okay, can Carrie. Yes. I'll be brief. Uh, I have been encouraging you, Steve Whitaker, uh, for a long time. This is an organization that claims to not be bound by public records law, that gets city money, that has offices in City Hall, 
and is not accountable. Do you have a comment about the council rep? To the yes, because that, that is the, what is the topic. Yes, that council rep is going to be the focus of all my public records requests for the Montpelier Alive. So we will enforce some transparency on that organization. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carrie. I just want to reiterate what I said earlier about the appreciation for how many people who are actually using the Girton structure coming out and talking to us about it because we often hear from people who have opinions about what other people are doing and about other people's experiences. And so I encourage more folks to come out and share their personal experiences with us along those lines. Thank you. Connor. Okay. Um, just since we've been talking about vice and everything, uh, Officer Philbrick and I took a tour of uh, the Patients Alliance um, dispensary um, and just wanted to give an update on that. I think they've done a really good job reaching out. I, I know um, yeah, met, met with Bill the other day just to talk about the plans, but right now it looks like they're opening in July and would potentially be the first retail dispensary in the state, actually, because Burlington is not slated till October and I think Brattleboro as well. Uh, so, you know, you could see a lot of activity in that area of town, uh, but, you know, I, I think taking the tour was really interesting. You got to see the security on it. Uh, it's a very professional uh, operation that's had a really good relationship with the city while they provided the me mar uh, medical marijuana there. Um, so they were, they were very open that any counselor, anybody who's interested could uh, pop in for a tour, and I definitely recommend it. Um, and also, I may be at a town next council meeting, so I'll talk to you guys. Just okay. To, okay. okay, good to know. All right, Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to um, thank Chief Pete for the tour that we got um, last Friday. Carrie and I um, toured the police station, and um, I did a ride along with one of the officers. And I have to say, um, I have never had a good relationship with police ever in my life. And um, my time spent with you and um, can't remember his name, Kevin. Um, such a different experience than my childhood um, with police officers. And I really enjoyed my time. I had, we had a great conversation. Um, he answered a lot of questions. I answered a lot of questions for him. We went on some calls. Um, and we rode by Girton Park several times, and everybody there knew him, and everybody said hi to him, and it was just a, a really great experience, and I, I just really appreciate that. You've kind of made me feel a little less um, uncomfortable, and I, you know, we could go into this for hours, but I just wanted to say thank you, and thank you for this opportunity of being on council to be able to do that. I just, it was very special, so thank you. Yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, thank you. Jack. There are a bunch of uh, you know, springs here. Uh, there are a bunch of events uh, coming up. And the one I want to mention is, uh, is this Sunday, the Race Against Racism, uh, gathering at the high school, 10 a.m. to 1230. Um, there's going to be speakers, other stuff, and then, and then the 5K run or walk. Um, so could be a good time and for a good cause. Yeah. Lauren. Yes, just very briefly, just echo the gratitude. So appreciate the input from the community. Um, appreciate that the council's taking up the police review committee. Uh, we took on some meaty <laughs> topics. You're welcome. Um, and <laughs> grateful to be able to have some hard conversations together in a really thoughtful way. Um, and with the the chief and the team at uh, at the city. So um, looking forward to more. But <laughs> but thank you all. Great. Uh, so I just have a couple of things. Uh, Thank you for mentioning the Race Against Racism on Sunday. Uh, there's also a rally for the planet uh, hosted by the youth lobby that is going to be Friday, April 29th. Uh, the youth march goes from the state, I'm sorry, from the high school to the state house lawn that marches at 10 a.m. And starting at like 10 15, there'll be live music, there'll be speakers. Uh, there's a green jobs fair. Uh, that starts at 1130 also at the State House. Uh, it's going to be a student teach ins. It's going to be a, a great event. So uh, check out the State House lawn on Friday. And uh, 
also something that super important um so i'm thinking about the july 3rd parade um and i hope that you all will be there to represent the council and um one thought so the sign up form just came out for that and it was saying if you are just a walk and wave there's going to be a 25 dollars fee do we uh, we've always just been a walk and wave i assume that's what we want to do again but i thought i'd at least put it out there if, you, if there's something you can float. yeah right do we want to have a flow do we <laughs> we don't get charged <laughs> yeah right right exactly if you have ideas about what else we could do awesome but if not you know whatever <laughs> right right exactly uh anyway just be thinking about about uh the july 3rd parade that's all um okay john okay Bill. okay uh so with that uh we are at the end of our business so 10 22 we'll declare the meeting adjourned thank you everybody have a great evening